Pokemon's Generation 5 era, or the Black and White era, is a pretty interesting one when it comes to continuing on from the Diamond and Pearl era, and leading us into the X and Y era, which is up next. The Unova region brings us to a semi-US inspired area to explore, but still being based on some Japanese locations to deliver something special to evolving the gaming space, showing that exploring a larger city is really cool for the series, and a story so much deeper in terms of writing that when we got the following third game, we didn't get Pokemon Gray version, but Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. But what does this mean for the show? Where will Ash's journey go throughout this region with some new friends to travel around the area with, new Pokemon to see or catch, as well as what it all sets up for Ash's future? So yes, it's time to embark back on our adventures with Ash, Ketchum, and Pikachu as we make our way through the world of Pokemon. From his start in the Kanto region to his final moments of his journey that have recently come to an end this year, with the Pokemon Horizons anime focusing on all new characters. Characters. Ash has had an incredible multiple decade span that has brought so much joy to so many, and gave new fans different jumping on points thanks to the generational structure of the franchise, which sets the stage for the anime to follow as well. Much like this series here on the channel, each part can be viewed standalone, but can also be viewed as part of a larger package. Documenting Ash and how he has evolved into who he becomes is a fun road to venture down as each generation brings out something new for him. So without further ado, let's hop back into our next leg of the journey with the black and white anime series, containing four separate seasons, four, but really three, movies in total, giving us a whole bunch to cover today. Choose your newest starter and let's hit the road with Ash. Last time we were with Ash and friends, we traveled the Sinnoh region, getting the return of Brock and the addition of fan favorite partner Dawn, as Ash had to grow through becoming closer with his ex rival turned ally Gary and deal with a burning new rivalry in Paul, who brought reverse ideals to Ash as we learn about Paul's past and where his future is heading. We got to see the evolution of Ash's relationship to his Pokemon, sharing a connection to Chimchar, a Pokemon that Paul ditched that now struggles with its emotions and power levels, that Ash is able to break through and work extremely well with, mirroring some similar traits to Ash and his Charizard, who he originally saved as an abandoned Charmander. Brock was able to learn about and follow a career path that truly calls out to him, as well as Dawn learning more and more about the type of Pokemon trainer she wants to become, focusing heavily on the Pokemon contests and where that can take her with her personal strengths. Ash's relationship to Pikachu continues to grow into an unbreakable bond that make their future look brighter than ever, as Ash finds himself heading back home to Pallet Town before he starts up on his next big adventure in the universe region, which was teased for us from the Zoroark Master of Illusions movie, giving us our sights on where new friends, new Pokemon, and new adventures lie. So now, let's jump into the first season of Pokemon Black and White. We catch up right where we left off as Ash has returned home and excitedly grabs his gear to head out on a new adventure, but we learn that this was all supposed to be a vacation, one that the professor is looking forward to. Ash, Pikachu, his mother, and the professor board a plane and begin heading towards the Unova region, where Oak makes Ash even more excited based on the Pokemon here not being found in basically any other region, at least not now, making him determined to also meet some new Pokemon while he is there. In the background of all of this, Team Rocket, with our usual three, are are on board the same flight making their way to the region, as Giovanni is interested in the Unova region based on his intel of a new organization that appeared on his radar located in that area as well. Upon arriving, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows, literally, as Pikachu's attention faces towards a dark cloud coming onto the land where electricity is clearly surging, but as a storm cloud, it definitely is a bit odd. In this distraction, Team Rocket makes an attempt to capture Pikachu, but the sky had other plans. With the dark cloud completely taking over the sky 
in sending a lightning bolt crashing down that takes care of Team Rocket and sets Pikachu free from the cage they had him in. But in a connected bolt of lightning being sent back and forth between Pikachu and the sky, the attention of where this is coming from makes itself known, as the legendary Pokemon Zekrom makes an appearance from the jump for the region, showing off a menacing force of its power. During this, a person we have not met yet notices what is going on along with her partner Pokemon and Axew, who both make their way toward the center of the situation. Who's that Pokemon? Zekrom releases a final show of strength onto both Ash and Pikachu before disappearing for now, and the skies return to normal, as if none of this ever happened. Much like Pikachu's entrances to the previous regions, this leaves him weak and in need of some help for it, and his electricity is starting to spark up a bit. Again, another sign of something we've seen before with Pikachu when entering a new region. The newest regional professor arrives to meet them all, as Professor Juniper picks them all up as they head to her lab in her car, and upon arrival, she wants to take a look at Pikachu and help him recover. During this time, we meet another new character to this arc for the series named Trip, who makes it no secret that they are going to become this region's rival for Ash, as he makes fun of the town Ash is from, sending them into a heated argument. Trip also shows some traits like Paul had based on selecting their partner Pokemon, carefully choosing the best possible choice for how they plan on being a Pokemon trainer, selecting Snivy, Unova's grass type starter, and offending the fire starter Tepig and the water starter Oshawott for how this whole selection went down. Getting all of his gear for the journey along with his first Pokemon, Trip heads out for now as Ash catches up to them and learns about the Unova League, which is the same setup as before, needing eight badges from across the region leading up to the championships at the end. Pikachu comes running out of the lab towards Ash as he has made a nice recovery, and of course, Pikachu comes running out of the lab towards Ash as he has made a nice recovery, and of course, based on his power levels, Trip wants to immediately battle Ash right then and there, as he documents all of the moments on camera, adding to how this trainer will be studying Pokemon for their training research. While the battle was going back and forth for a moment, Pikachu is having issues performing any electricity-based attacks, giving Trip material to mock Ash with. Because of this and his still weakened state, Pikachu loses the battle to the Snivy, as Trip pokes fun at his trainer skills as Ash rushes back to Juniper's lab. After some more tests at the lab, Pikachu is overloaded with electricity once more, but from the power of Zekrom, Pikachu is currently unable to perform electric-based attacks. Suddenly, electricity and electronics in general start start going haywire, as the dark cloud makes its way back to the area, with a bolt of lightning striking the lab and cutting all of the power and directly linking with Pikachu again. Now as Professor Juniper understands what the cloud is, she explains it to the others, and mentions Zekrom being the guardian protector of the area, but something is clearly wrong as Zekrom's eyes are piercing red, and the lightning storm rages on. Ash jumps in to grab Pikachu, but this causes him to feel the power of the shock as well as he falls to the floor alongside Pikachu, with Zekrom now disappearing once more. Even while hurt, Ash gets up concerned about Pikachu, and this poor little fella has gone through so much no matter where he goes. But luckily, it seems electricity may be flowing correctly through him again, as Ash has him use attacks on him to see if the electrical-based attacks are back. And to his own pain, they, they seem to be okay. Once things have calmed down from this event, Ash announces to everyone that he wants to spend time in the Unova region, and go on a new adventure here as well as take part in the Unova League, as Ash will only have Pikachu with him to start off once again, giving him an open opening to capture and make plenty of new Pokemon friends along this journey. He is given a new updated Pokedex for the region, some gear, and is sent off in the direction of his first gym challenge. His route takes him through a forest where he thinks he spots his first Pokemon, as he sees something purple in the bushes. But upon checking his Pokedex, it shows him the information for Axew, who is in fact not purple. Uh, go figure. He throws a Pokeball anyway, but to his surprise, it wasn't a Pokemon, but a girl. A girl whose name is Iris. Ash apologizes for that, and all is good as she introduces herself and Axew to them, Ash apologizes for that and all is good as she introduces herself and her Axew to them, and she kinda gets excited to see a Pikachu and squeezes him with a hug harder than Timon's mom in Lion King one and a half. Choking, not breathing. The result of this though ends in her getting a little shock from Pikachu, and now she apologizes to Pikachu for that. The two trainers chatted up a bit trying to understand the Dark Cloud occurrence as well as Zekrom. Once again though, Ash has to learn that he must battle Pokemon, not just throw Pokeballs at them when he spots a Deerling that leads him to a herd of them, with Iris repeating that fact that at this point he should be more than well aware of. Later on as the night rolls in, the lot of them enjoy some apples and discuss further about the mysterious world of Pokemon, and the fantastical Pokemon like Zekrom 
Necrom that are out there, until Iris and Axu fall asleep, giving Ash and Pikachu a moment to stargaze and ponder on their upcoming adventures. And as a shooting star flies by, it gives them the right spirit for what the Unova region holds. But what's this? Oshawott ended up following them, sneaking out from the bushes unbeknownst to them. But for now, the morning comes and Iris and Axu have disappeared, so his adventures leads him to finding an opportunity to catch his first Pokemon, getting into a rather semi-intense battle with a pit of, who manages to escape his Pokeball once, but eventually is captured by one and officially joins Ash's team as the newest regional bird for Ash to grow alongside for their travels. Iris and Axu appear back after this, but before long, after sharing some food, Team Rocket makes an attempt to capture Pikachu, and now by extension, Axu. Ash uses his newly captured pit of to jump in and help, but Jesse and James may have some new fifth generation Pokemon to help them, as a Woobat comes out and defeats the pit of. But to be fair, she was already very much weakened from the battle she just had with Ash. But when all seems hopeless and Team Rocket is making an escape, Oshawott jumps in to attack, sending Team Rocket crashing with both Iris and Ash catching their respective Pokemon. Team Rocket though is surprisingly back up for a battle, but before Pikachu and Axew could even be feeling good enough to get into that battle, Oshawott continues to take the reins here, and finishes them off as Oshawott now gets thanked for their help. But they quickly take Pikachu and Axew to the nearest Pokemon Center, running towards it and leaving Oshawott behind. As they get their Pokemon all healed up, they think about why that random Oshawott came and helped them, with Ash not knowing that this is the same Oshawott from Juniper's lab, and had followed him on his adventure. At the same time, the Oshawott is looking at him from a distance, clearly still following them. Shortly after this, along Ash's momentum to continue on to the first gym, he gets into an argument with Iris over both of them going in the same direction, claiming each other is following each other. But the real entity that was following them was Oshawott, as Pikachu gets pushed out of the way by him, so their tensions rise, leaving Ash the accidental victim of the attacks. Ash offers the Oshawott to join his team, to which he wanted to, but Ash couldn't catch him because Oshawott is already registered to a Pokeball back at Professor Juniper's lab. So now that he knows it's the same Oshawott from the lab, he rings up the Professor and gets the Pokeball sent to him. She does mention to him that this Oshawott has an issue with potentially liking to run off. Well, I guess we all know that since it ran from the lab to follow Ash anyway, but also he just ran away again. That's great. During this search for Oshawott, we run into a new Pokemon for the region, Sandile, where much like Squirtle, one is wearing some sunglasses and also begins to just follow Ash around. You know, throughout his journeys, a lot of Pokemon just end up following Ash, which is pretty funny that this is how Ash gets a portion of his Pokemon at least. But in the end of this little side mission here to get Oshawott back, he is able to get the water starter in his original Pokeball and all is good for now. But that won't be the only regional starter that Ash gets. We need another dramatic abandoned fire starter Pokemon for his roster as well. But let me catch up to that. Ash and Iris who are now traveling together, but really not traveling together at this point arrive in Akumula Town, where Ash is able to learn about the Pokemon Battle Club, which is like Fight Club, but you get to talk up. Dang it, I just talked about Fight Club. Uh, hey, look over here at how many copies of the film I have. <laughs> Please don't tell Brad Pitt that I mentioned the name of this film, thanks. Here we meet Don George, the owner of several of these Battle Club facilities all over the region. Ash gets noticed for his Pikachu by Don, and one of the other trainers who just won a battle offers Ash a battle. But Oshawott jumps out and wants the smoke, but seeing that the opponent's Pokemon is Oshawott's evolution Duot, he lets Pikachu take on the battle instead. The battle though comes to a pause thanks to some nearby commotion from Team Rocket, leading Ash to eventually find a Tepig in need of some help, having a rope tied around his mouth, freeing it and giving him some food. Speaking with Don, we learn that that Tepig was abandoned by some trainer who left it after losing a battle. When trying to still follow his trainer, Tepig ended up tied up and abandoned there. So thanks to Ash's help, the Tepig feels grateful and stands with him to fight off Team Rocket from their shenanigans and chooses to stick with Ash, even if Iris wanted to capture him, giving Ash his third new Pokemon in just four episodes of the new series, two of which being starter Pokemon, one of which being another abandoned fire starter. Some things just never change. <laughs> Continuing on from that town, Ash and Iris find themselves in the next major area, Striton City, where right away we meet Silen, a sharply dressed man with green hair who is fascinated with Ash and Iris along with their partner Pokemon. He is a Pokemon connoisseur, someone who can judge the relationship a Pokemon trainer has to their Pokemon. In search of the city's gym, Silen leads them to where it is, as it has the appearance of a restaurant where two others answer his request for a battle, the red and blue haired waiters named Chili and Cress. For the moment, Ash gets served 
serves as if he was there for some food. But Ash is impatient and is upset that there is no battle, trying to leave in anger. But the lights dim as now the two waiters, plus Silen, all reveal themselves as the gym leaders of the city, a trio of brothers ready to battle. Something similar to the sisters of Cerulean City, aka Misty's sisters. Each one of the brothers has a corresponding Pokemon to match their hair. That being each of the three new monkey Pokemon, Panseer the fire type, Panpour the water type, and finally Pansage the grass type. Ash wants a battle against all three of them, with Ash having to defeat two of them to win his first badge. Panseer is up first, with Ash choosing to fight fire with fire, sending out Tepig for the battle. Tepig may not be super powerful yet, but the performance it gives while listening to Ash results in the fire pig being able to defeat the fire monkey, giving Ash the first round victory. Next up is Panpour, and Pikachu steps up next to battle. Surprisingly, Pikachu is taken out by the Panpour, making it a tied battle at one win each for the gym leaders and Ash, making the third battle now against Silent and his Pansage, with Oshawott coming out to handle this battle. For the match point, Oshawott has another panic moment of not wanting to battle initially. Aside from showing off an incredible bit of help against Team Rocket when he first appeared, he hasn't been the same since seeing that evolutionary form, but eventually gets into the spirit after being reminded of how tough he truly is from Ash. As this fierce battle rages on, Oshawott is struggling to defeat the Pansage, and Silent dishes out his catchphrase of, time for the battle to be served, but I ordered a Caesar salad, so I'm going to have to send this dish back. Silent doesn't hold back on judging Ash either, claiming his connection to Oshawott and the choices that he is making in the battle are not all that great, but Ash doesn't subscribe to the notion that type advantages matter all that much. After several more food-related quotes from Silen, which I am sure won't get annoying, Oshawott pulls off the win in the end, shocking all of the gym leaders. Ash now earns his first badge in Unova, excitedly showing off his new trio badge. Iris spoils the moment though, criticizing Ash for the tight matchups that he chose, but at this point, I think Ash knows what he's doing. Because of this constant feuding between the two, Silen questions if they actually are traveling together, to which Iris says no, and leaves. Not long later at the Pokemon Center, Ash is stopped by Silent again, having more questions for him in regards to the battle that they had. But Iris runs in with Axew not looking too good. This is all thanks to some Dream Mist from the drowsing Pokemon, Musharna, the evolved version of the Dream Eater Pokemon, Muna, who comes along with someone named Professor Fennel, who helps wake up the Axew from the mist. Officer Jenny rolls up, warning them all to put their Pokemon away, and to stay clear of the mist that is causing this forced pink glowing sleep to happen. Pikachu is not one for Pokeballs, so they just place Ash's hat on him for now. The group here all help out the professor in reuniting with the Musharna and stopping the sleep madness and the daydreaming is saved, as now Silent makes an announcement to his brothers that he wants to travel around with Ash and learn more from him and his interesting ways of training and battling. Iris decides to tag along as well, officially giving us the trio of trainers for this part of the journey, as they all make their way to where the next gym lies. Now, we have two of the region starters and something Ash is sure good at most times is somehow ending up with every starter Pokemon from those regions. Here, it's no different, as Ash wants the grass starter Stivey a part of his team after coming across one. Similar to other grass starters, Ash needs to earn the respect of this grass snake, as it's being quite the hard catch here. By the end of this episode though, that Snivy has gone through some battles with Ash and escaping Jesse from Team Rocket's attempts to catch her, so she sees that Ash is truly a trainer that she could be confident in becoming part of his team. Catching the Snivy and sending it back out to reassure that their journey together will be great, and Snivy seems happy to be a part of the team. Ash now has a team of five Pokemon already, and three of which are the new starter Pokemon. Talk about being OP from the jump. We learn more about Iris and Axew, and how they come together and how she is meant to care for and train the Axew up to its final evolution, Haxorus, which we got to see back when being asleep from the dream mist that Axew dreams of evolving fully. Iris talks about where she is from, a place called the Village of Dragons, and that Axew was given to her from the elder in the village as a rite of passage for a young trainer to fully be recognized as a trainer that truly understands their connection to their Pokemon. I really like this moment in the show, giving some good motivation and struggles for Iris, as she is concerned about their training and how Axew is developing, offering some good growth for her character and Axew throughout the series. Later on, the trio find themselves in Luxuria Town, where another battle club exists. Don George appears again to Ash's excitement, but upon him not remembering Ash, we learn that much like Nurse Joy or Officer Jenny, Don George is an omnipotent entity that exists in multiple versions of himself for all of the battle clubs. Okay, but in reality, it's the same setup of there just being a large family of Don Georges that run the individual clubs. Trip appears once more, being the rude rival that he is, as we learn that Trip has acquired two badges already, as well as caught a bunch of Pokemon himself, and his Snivy has now evolved into the next evolutionary form, Servine. After refusing to battle a trainer with only 
one badge like Ash, he gets his mind changed and decides he will battle Ash once more in a five on five battle. Trip sends out his Tranquil first as Ash sends out his Oshawott, who quickly gets defeated by the bird. Ash realizes that he may be in trouble here, but is determined as always to continue the battle. Ash sends out his Tepig, but once again, the Tranquil is too powerful and defeats the Tepig. Pikachu decides to step in now, this time having his electrical abilities back to fight Trip. Pikachu, taking full advantage of this, ends up defeating Tranquil, giving him the first defeat of one of Trip's Pokemon. Trip Servine comes out now and shows off just how powerful it is. When it was a Snivy being able to defeat Pikachu at the start of the series, and continuing that now as Servine being able to defeat Pikachu once more. In annoyance of Trip's taunting over that and how for the whole battle is going so far, Ash sends out Snivy. Snivy is able to get the upper hand and take out the Servine, leaving Trip surprised that that was even possible. Frillish is his next Pokemon of choice for the battle and Ash swaps out Snivy for his Pitov. But with little training experience thus far and going up against the powerful floating jellyfish, Pitov loses the battle quickly, leaving Ash with his Snivy left for the battle, who was already worn out from her previous battle. While Snivy put up a fierce final fight, the Frillish was able to defeat her and Ash is declared the loser of this battle, losing to Trip for a second time, but at least putting up a decent fight back against him. Trip taunts him once more afterwards, giving the backhanded compliments of how well his Snivy and Pikachu battled, but how pathetic and weak his other Pokemon are. Ash of course challenges him to another future battle that he mentions he will consider, but we all know that plenty more Trip interactions will be happening. It's Paul all over again, just like Paul 2.0. He even looks a bit like Paul, ripping off his whole attitude flow bar for bar, leaving Paul somewhere out there in the world of Pokemon on some radio station being all like, Trip? Trip! Not long after, on a side quest from the main journey, Ash ends up receiving an egg to take care of from a daycare owner, adding on this responsibility for him to have for now. From here, Ash and company make it to the next destination and meet up with Lenora, the gym leader for Not Green City, and eventually they end up having a battle, with Ash having his Tepig come out to face her Lillipup. But the pupper quickly uses Roar, sending Tepig right back into the Pokeball, and out comes Oshawa, who is basically asleep at this time, having to wake up and prepare for this battle as she swaps for her watch whose mean look prevents Ash from calling back Oshawott for now. Oshawott puts up a good fight, but not a fierce enough one to match the Watch Hog's abilities, and is defeated as both trainers swap out now for Ash's Tepig coming out to fight her Lillipup. Again, this fight ends pretty quickly too, as Lillipup wastes no time in knocking out Tepig, resulting in Ash's loss in the battle and not earning his second badge. Lenora though still enjoyed that battle and how Ash handled himself with his strategies, offering him a rematch whenever he felt ready to do so. After a of training, Ash returns to the gym for his second attempt at the battle, where now Lenora's Lillipup has evolved into a Herdier, and a rematch between the now even stronger Pup and Tempig commences. After Tepig is able to put up a stronger fight this time, Roar is used again to force Ash to swap out Pokemon, now once more having Oshawott back on the field as she switches to her Watch Hog again. Oshawott also puts up a stronger fight this time, but is clearly barely left standing by the end of it, but both Oshawott and Watch Hog give one final strong attack back and forth, resulting in Oshawa using Aqua Jet after being sent flying from a Thunderbolt, coming crashing down with the attack onto Watch Hog, leaving both of them unable to battle, giving the trainers one win apiece. With their only options being Tepig and Herdier again, Tepig is determined to win his battle and prove himself, giving us another battle where Tepig is barely standing by the end, but isn't willing to give up. But now Herdier is in the same position, not being able to outlast in stamina to stay standing when staring down Tepig and faints, giving the victory to Ash as he now officially earns his second badge, the basic badge. Lenora even comments on how impressed she is with the way Ash is able to strategize and care for his Pokemon during a battle, kind of boosting up Ash as if it feels most times he is just criticized for his battling style by others. For the next bit of their traveling to the next gym, Ash's egg finally hatches, and it turns out to be the Pokemon Scraggy, giving him another Pokemon for his team to train. Ash also catches a Sawaddle soon after this and adds them to the team as well. We also get to see some Ducklet at one point, which is real Breaking Nate's favorite Pokemon. <laughs> totally not Psyduck. A hundred percent. It's Ducklet. Don't let him tell you different. As well as that sand dial with the sunglasses that is following Ash evolves into a Crocorock. The group has now made it to their next destination, Castelia City, where we get another run-in with Trip for a moment and Ash's pit of evolves into a Tranquil, when Ash and Trip technically work together to wrangle up some Venipede in the area, as each of them now have a Tranquil on their teams. Someone they have met recently was Berg, who is actually the next gym leader, giving Ash the chance to battle now, with the first matchup in the battle being Tepig facing off against Dwebble, to which 
which Dwebel quickly gets the upper hand and defeats Tepig, with Ash now sending out his Sawaddle. The battle may just be turning around as Sawaddle is able to knock out Dwebel, with the gym leader's next Pokemon being Whirlipede, who serves to be really powerful, finally trying to end the battle with a Solar Beam that directly hits Sawaddle, but it ends up being absorbed into the Sawaddle, leaving him glowing. The power of the Solar Beam and Sawaddle's determination ends up mixing together for Sawaddle to evolve on the spot into a Swadloon, who now has the power and energy to end up defeating the Whirlipede. Berg's last Pokemon turns out to be Levani, the final evolution for the Sawada line, who is able to take out the newly evolved Swadloon, leaving Ash on his final Pokemon as well for this battle. With that being Oshawott. Just kidding, Oshawott wanted to step into the battle on his own, but Ash chooses Pikachu for the end of this battle. But Pikachu was the right call because the powerful Levani was ultimately defeated with a combination of Pikachu's Iron Tail and a newer move he just recently learned, Electro Ball, giving Ash now his third badge, the Insect Badge. Bianca, another trainer that the group ran into a bit back, now ends up joining them for a bit as part of their travels, really only being there as Iris catches an Amolga that isn't the best at listening to battle commands and ends up starting a rivalry with Ash's Snivy before she ends up departing from the group. We also get some more time with Iris and her storyline regarding her training of Axew as a responsibility, but now fully sets forward a path for her goals to become a Dragon Master, which is just like being a Pokemon trainer, but one that mainly focuses on Dragon type Pokemon. Now, it's not long after just seeing Trip that we get to see him again, and this time, Ash ruins Trip's attempt to catch a Palpitoad, but we at least get another battle between the two. Also, Trip now has an additional two badges from where we last saw how many he had, only fueling Ash further with determination. For this three on three battle, Trip brings out Servine as Snivy comes out as Ash's choice. Last time, Snivy surprised Trip by being able to defeat his Servine, so let's see if that happens again here. The answer is no. Specifically because Trip was ready with counter maneuvers to what happened last time that Snivy was not ready for, and lost rather swiftly. Trip remarks about how Ash has not improved or learned to adapt over the course of time since their last battle, as we also learn about the Unova League champion Alder. Trip now sends out Timber, and Ash sends out Oshawott, who becomes a bit scared once again from the situation, trying to get Ash to send in Pikachu instead. But Ash gives Oshawott a little pep talk, telling him that he believes he is capable of taking on this challenge. Oshawott's attacks, however, aren't fully there yet in mastering, specifically that Aqua Jet, where his eyes keep shutting when he uses the move, causing it to not be a focused attack and be more sporadic and all over the place. The battle has been paused for a moment as Trip has captured some photos on his camera to show this to Ash, both being condescending, but also a good teachable moment with constructive criticism. Oshawott, for now, at least will not use that attack in the battle, and through a series of other moves like Razor Shell, the two Pokemon clash and end up in a Timber knockout situation. Ash sends out Tepig and Trip sends out Vanillite, everyone's favorite Pokemon to point out for Pokemon creature designs being creatively bankrupt, but I'd like to think that people nowadays have come to enjoy more Pokemon that fit that call-out category, uh, but to each their own, no judgment. This battle of fire and ice comes to a head when both Pokemon end up fainting, leaving the match as a draw for the rules given out. So I guess at least Ash didn't lose this time right? Ash vows to fully win the next time as Trip continues away from the group. Ash now spends some time directly training with Oshawott, helping him overcome not being able to open his eyes while using Aqua Jet, and they are able to accomplish this feat. And Ash even catches that Palpitoad. So take that, Trip. This season, Ash has pretty much gone Pokemon catching crazy, at least more so than some of the other seasons, catching another new Pokemon, Roggenrola. As another little side series, Ash and company get involved in a battle club tournament, because we know Ash loves his random random side tournaments. For Ash's matchup, he goes up against the trainer named Burgundy, a Pokemon connoisseur who has been the rival of Silent. She uses Estoutland, the fully evolved version of Lillipup, as Ash uses his new Palpitoad. By the end of this quicker battle, Ash ends up victorious and proceeds to the next round of the tournament. For Ash's next battle, he goes up against Georgia, a dragon-type trainer who has become the rival of Iris. She sends out Ponyard, as Ash has sent out his Snivy for this battle. It ends up turning into a pretty fierce battle where Snivy is struggling throughout to a point where Ash is trying his best to get Snivy to recover from the various attacks and isn't fully able to get up at one point with Ponyard coming after her. Snivy though is eventually able to recover and ends up delivering a strong final blow with Leaf Storm as Ash moves on to the semi-finals and in the good spirit of things, Ash compliments her on a great battle but her attitude being sour already keeps her from accepting it from him and blames the battlefield that they were battling on as the problem. Later on, Ash's next battle for the semi-finals 
is with Dino, who sends out a Darumaka as Ash uses Palpatode once more. In a quicker battle than the rest, Ash and Palpatode are able to defeat Dino and his Darumaka, as Ash is now heading to the finals. For the finals though, it's Ash versus Iris, which makes this quite the interesting battle to see between them and in such an official capacity, with an audience and all. Ash decides on using Old Faithful, aka Pikachu, with Iris using her Excadrill. Sadly, the battle isn't as wild and drawn out as it may seem, and ends pretty quickly with Excadrill getting the upper hand and knocking out Pikachu, giving Iris the win, meaning she has won the entire tournament, being given the winning prize of a shadow box display plaque of the different stat boosting wings, or technically feathers, and honestly, if this was a real item for sale on the Pokemon Center website, I would totally buy it. I already buy stuff like this, this chess set and, and the train set, heck, even this coin set, so this would look great on my wall. For another fun part of the journey after the tournament, Meowth from Team Rocket ends up joining the team, saying that he was fired from Team Rocket, coming up with this whole sob story of being let go and being on his own now, as well as needing their help when they found him. So after some convincing, Meowth is able to hang out with them for a handful of episodes until it's revealed in Nimbasa City that it was all a ruse this entire time to get close to them and capture all at once a bunch of Pokemon from the Pokemon Center, which in turn also meant all of the group's Pokemon, and they get away using the subway. Eat fresh. Sorry for that. I have brain rot. But through working together with Ingo and Emmett, the group are able to foil Team Rocket's master plan, which kudos to them, this one worked out pretty well in the first half, but like usual, they lost in the second. With all the Pokemon being returned and our group getting their Pokemon back, Ash now has a chance to go to the Nimbasa City Gym to battle for his next badge. But for now, with Ash heading off to that next big battle, our time with the first season of the Black and White series is over. Lots of great stuff has happened. Ash has captured quite a few Pokemon, has a full-on party of travel companions, a new rival, and a few badges to boot. So I'm sure the next season has a lot in store for us. Who's that Pokemon? Now, I've stated in the past few videos, but the Pokemon movies really have no impact on the main story of the show, so I don't like spending too long on what happens in the films for these videos. They don't take away anything from the journey, and they don't add anything to the journey. While the earlier films, mainly the first handful, have some heavy nostalgia attached to them, specifically for someone like me who grew up with them, and they offer some incredible moments that just emphasize the character we know from the show. So if it feels like I don't spend a lot of time on the movies here, that's my reasoning why. I still think they are for sure worthy of mentioning since it technically is Ash's journey playing out, but in all honesty, it's usually a lot of lore or some crazy thing happening with legendary Pokemon and Ash just kind of happens to be there and helps out where he can. He does that a bunch within the show itself, but it truly carries on into the rest of the series, whereas the movies are purposely made to not interfere and leave our characters the same as to not ruin anything happening in the show or make you feel lost or missing something if you didn't see it. It. but I still add them in anyway because I think you're pretty neat. I just may not go too deep into any of them versus the show. For the first movie in the black and white era, we did have something rather unique here as the film was released as two separate movies, where Victini is the starring mystical Pokemon here, but there is a black version and a white version of the film. But both films are essentially the same. You wouldn't have too much of a different experience if you watched one over the other. I will go over those differences in a moment, but as far as the story goes, Ash and friends make their way to a new town, one that is set around a castle called the Sword of Vale, for obvious reasons of looking like a sword in the stone, technically. With a competition drawing in Ash to participate, like usual, we get to meet another mythical cute little Pokemon, this time being Victini. The exposition of the lore for the film is pretty cool, having this fairy tale like feel to it that takes up a large portion of the film to set up a mirroring finale, but there is a reason that the story feels a bit padded with that, along with a lot of time spent just kind of hanging out with Victini doing cute things and that's so the changes between the films are easier to slot in and out. Although I will give them credit because they did more than just swap out the cover legendaries here. The lore tells us about a king and Victini who watched over the whole kingdom and the people that lived there, having the power of what they called the Dragon Force. Anyone want to play Guitar Hero? That comes from the earth to help keep the kingdom and its citizens well taken care of. The king though had two sons who were twins that had the power to control 
control one of each of the legendary dragon Pokemon, with one son controlling Reshiram being the hero of truth and the other controlling Zekrom being the hero of ideals. While the main show deals with part of the lore in a similar way, the encounters in this movie don't affect the story to come later in the show that we haven't reached yet. The two sons begin to go to war with their beliefs having the power of each Pokemon fight for them, but the battle results in the dragon's energy being drained and they transform into orbs that represent them called Dragonstones. From this, the kingdom was thrown into disarray, having the dragon force change into a destructive force that is harming the land. The king, worried for his kingdom, has Victini offer his powers to control this power, creating the Pillars of Destruction, using the floating sword of Veil with all of the citizens inside to move it to a mountaintop, staking it into the ground where the king's no longer moving castle resides, as the king then passes away. Both sons vowed to hide the dragon stones in the depths of the castle for safety of not letting this ever happen again. Spoiler alert, there wouldn't be a movie if it wasn't about to happen again. In modern times, we meet a character named Damon, whose lineage comes from the people of the Vale, as he has a goal of resurrecting the kingdom lost to time. His plan involves seeking out one of the dragons, mixed with the forced help of Victini to do so, placing the current day town and everyone who lives in there at risk if this happens. Ash, being the hero that he is, would need to combat Damon with the help of the opposite dragon to help save the day, facing off against him as the castle ascends high into the sky. Now with the dragons at peace after the battle, the true nature of destruction is shown from high above, having Damon face the consequences of his actions, even if he felt what he was doing was just. Damon and Ash are left trapped by the pillars of protection as Damon is granted the power of the dragons to help fix everything. With the castle now being high up in the atmosphere, Ash is struggling to survive, especially from the cold temperatures while the dragons try to destroy the pillars, but nothing is really happening. We get another moment where, uh-oh, is, is Ash going to die again? But we all know that he won't, and now through the power of Victini, it uses all of its strength to break the pillars holding this destructive dragon force, allowing it to shoot out into space for some other planet eventually to deal with, I guess. As the castle now comes back down to Earth, Damon helps warm Ash back up to being okay, but Victini seemingly sacrificed their life in order to stop the threat, with the dragons now helping land the castle. In the end, Ash is sad and sorry that Victini gave their life to save everyone, but it's okay. Victini appears back once more and is no longer trapped by the pillars. Damon is sorry for all that he has caused and his intentions were initially good and for his people and now commits to helping rebuild with Victini there to help as well as our heroes move along on their journey for now. A sprout is then shown to be growing where the kingdom used to be, showing that life, uh, finds a way. Now, I think the movie itself is pretty fun, a nice and pretty wide scope segue from the main story that ends in a satisfying enough way. Like I said though, there are differences between the movies, like depending on the version that you watch, you'll have a different prologue that flips with a flashback later on, seeing both moments fully fleshed out in either film with full on new scenes. Along with that, yeah, the dragons are flipped for who Ash ends up teaming up with initially, either going with the power of ideals or courage of truth as the perspective taken, but this means that the battles are done differently as well for this part of the movie, having different scenes that still end in the same result, but even some scenes are just animated from a different perspective, which is nice to see an extra level of effort for something like this, that could have easily just been kept the same to cut around the other changes. There are different Pokemon in each version of the film, giving us the feeling of the video games having version exclusives, even Damon using different Pokemon in each version as well. Heck, in one version, the Golurk that we see is shiny, while the other version has the standard Golurk. It's just pretty cool to see. Watching both films just feels like I'm watching a film released in two separate realities. So for the experience, it's fun, and that's my takeaway from it. But yeah, none of that really breaks down into whatever is happening in the show, so let's go back to that for now. As they end up meeting the next gym leader, Elisa, they also meet up with Bianca again as well as her father, who is hard on her, not wanting her to go any further with her own journey in the Pokemon world, giving her an ultimatum that if she loses to the gym leader, she must come home with him, and she confidently accepts this. We witness her battle happen, which results in her losing, and once the Pokemon are all healed at the Pokemon Center and they have some time to get some food, Ash stands up to Bianca's dad about forcing her to come home and not grow as a trainer, while making a rash decision for his daughter, 
daughter, it's mainly out of worry for her. But Ash challenges her father to a battle with a new deal being that if he wins, she gets to continue on without going home, but if he loses, Ash must go home instead, essentially leaving the region and living the simple life back in Palantown. He sends out a Darmanitan that is in its zen mode state as Oshawa does his usual random pop out of a Pokeball, but Ash allows him to battle. During which we see the Darmanitan break out of the zen mode and have a strong back and forth with Oshawa to a point that Bianca's father is clearly winning the battle thus far, with Oshawa being very worn out. Bianca feels guilty Ash is doing this with her father even questioning why he would step in and risk the terms of the deal over it, as he exclaims that Bianca is his friend, showing her father that there are people out there looking out for her. Offering a smirk in response and finishing off the battle with Darmanitan defeating Oshawa, Bianca's father then tells Ash that the deal doesn't need to be seen through, having had a fun time with the battle and remembering the good times he had in the past and even pushes him to train even harder and to keep growing stronger. He also tells Bianca that she is free to continue on her own journey, especially having friends like Ash and company out there. The father and daughter hug it out and it's a happy ending for all. Ash is now able to face off against Elisa for his next gym battle in a three on three battle. She starts off with her Zebstrika and Ash sends out his Palpitoad first, who is just able to eat these attacks coming after him and is also able to eventually take out the Zebstrika. Next, she sends out a Molga as Ash's Palpitoad is ready to continue on for the fight, but thanks to a strong Aerial Ace, he ends up getting defeated. Ash spent a lot of time focusing on Palpitoad carrying the whole battle, but now, not being prepared for the outcome, he takes a moment to run out of the gym into the Pokemon Center to swap Pokemon, which apparently is just okay to do mid-battle, I guess. He comes back fast with Snivy now, but it didn't turn out to be worth it as Snivy is pretty quickly defeated, leaving Ash with a final choice of Pokemon for his battle, choosing to now fight electricity with electricity. Well, at least Pikachu made the decision for him, going for the whole relationship bond between him and his Pokemon over a typing strategy. Everyone always annoys him about this typing strategy thing, and the one time he does it, he's in trouble. So now, going back to his own version of the Heart of the Cards called Heart of the balls or something, I don't know, what do you want from me? Pikachu takes the field and now faces off against Emolga, mixing in a lot of Pikachu's speed to his attacks, being able to defeat the Emolga. And now it's down to her final Pokemon as well, sending out Tynamo, aka her Electric Queen, as she calls her. And this tiny little fishy is ready to square off against Pikachu. Tynamo is similar to Pikachu as it is also a very fast Pokemon, having the speed to not only keep up with Pikachu, but in some cases move faster. After a tiring battle, back and forth between the two, Pikachu is able to evade an incoming attack from Tynamo and swiftly land a heavy iron tail, sending the electric fish frying and flying into a wall, as Tynamo is no longer able to battle, resulting in Ash's fourth badge, the Bolt Badge. On their way to the next gym, the group runs into Trip again, who is in anticipation to meet the Unova League champion, Alder, that they all end up running into. Trip, distracted in the awe of trying to be parasocial towards him, gets annoyed at Ash for asking him for a battle before he could trying to push him out of the way and ask for the same. Alder decides to give Ash a battle though first, sending out his Bufalant with Pikachu stepping up to the plate here, but shortly into the battle, Alder has fallen asleep through a combination of needing some food, not being truly into a battle at the moment, and overall being a sleepy boy. Bufalant is angry at this and attacks him instead of Pikachu, but for now, the battle is over. Trip is disappointed in his idol and leaves, having no interest in battling him anymore if this is how serious he takes it. Through Spending some time with Alder, he asks the group what they plan to do when they finally accomplish their goals, giving them a moment to reflect on not really giving it all that much of a thought and giving us context clues to see how Alder may feel himself about being the champion. Before the group departs from Alder, he notes that he believes the most important thing for a trainer to accomplish their goals is their friendship between their Pokemon and how their bond develops, giving Ash even more determination for what the future holds. Ash eventually learns about triple battles and how they work, facing off against a trio of Maractus, but it was cut short thanks to one of the Maractuses being afraid of heights and the other parts of the trio all freaking out in tandem, so for their well-being the match is over, but at least Ash knows what a triple battle is now. Eventually they all arrive in Driftvale City, where Ash meets Clay, the gym leader for the city, but when Ash asks him for a battle, he denies him as he couldn't care less about battling right now since he was busy looking in the underground for something. Ash and his friends are pretty peeved about this, but after 
some side stuff, the group run into Clay again with Ash asking for a battle now, but he is still busy looking for a revival herb. So Ash does the Ash thing and offers to go and find it, and he agrees that if he does find it and brings it back to him, that they can finally have that battle. But this side quest turns into a pretty crazy encounter involving the forces of nature Pokemon, with both Thunderous and Tornadus, causing uh, some problems. The group must now figure out how to summon the remaining force of nature, Landorus. I say remaining force as the reveal of the fourth, that being Anamorous, wasn't around yet and only introduced recently through Pokemon Legends Arceus. Landorus can step in to help stop all of the madness from happening, so the group, along with Lewis, who is there to help them locate the herb, head to where Landorus's obelisk is to ask for help, summoning the third force of nature. Team Rocket tries to do their thing and capture these beasts, but Ash and his friends are able to stop this from happening, as well as help Landorus confront the two others and eventually gets them to stop all of this fighting, and together, all three work to replenish the area, including leaving revival herbs aplenty, as Ash now can return to Clay with them, and Clay will finally have that battle with Ash in return for doing so, sending out Crocorock first with Ash sending out Oshawa, and with the size and strength odds heavily in Clay's favor, Oshawa ends up pulling off the first win of the battle. Clay now sends out his next Pokemon, that being his own Palpatode as Oshawa stands firm and continuing to battle on for now. But Palpatode is able to get the upper hand here and finishes off Oshawa with a rock smash. Ash now sends out Snivy who quickly takes out the Palpatode, resulting in Clay's final Pokemon for the battle to come out, being an Excadrill, but in a furious way over Ash's tactics and using certain moves not being fair in his opinion, criticizing Ash's strategies in battle. So now with Clay being big mad and salty over the battle, Excadrill comes in strong and very quickly defeats Snivy, leaving Ash with his final Pokemon for the battle, his Roggenrola, who at one point during the battle just kind of stands there for a moment to everyone's concern, but the Roggenrola begins to evolve, turning into a Boldor. With this new power, Boldor is able to stand strong against the Excadrill, and with a strong final blow, Excadrill is knocked out, resulting in Ash winning his fifth gym badge, the Quake Badge. Clay's attitude towards Ash has changed, as he thanks him for a great battle before parting ways, as they continue on from there. Later on, after the group gets roped into exploring the hero's runes to learn more about Zekrom's relationship with the hero from the older legend about him, they run into the Crocorock with sunglasses that has been following them and is ready to face off against Ash and Pikachu. Pikachu knocks the sunglasses off the Crocorock, who scrambles in a panic to put them back on, but gets back into the battle but ultimately is defeated by Pikachu. Ash tries to check in on Crocorock, but he starts walking away sad for being defeated. Ash then offers him to join his team. Ash then offers him to join his team and his journey, to which Crocorock is excited to do so, as Ash then captures him. Not long after the group reaches Miss Charlton City, they meet up with Skyla, who is the gym leader there. After Silent and Skyla get into a battle over his anger in her battling ways and loses, Ash gets the chance to battle her now, as Skyla sends out her Swoobat with Ash using Crocorock first. Her skills with her aviation Pokemon make it easy for her to earn the first round win, with Swoobat taking out Crocorock. Ash now sends out his Tranquil, who is able to keep up with the Swoobat, and takes it out. She now sends out the evolved form of Tranquil and Unpheasant, specifically the male line evolution based on the visual look of the bird. Ash is worried about Tranquil and swaps out for Pikachu, and he is able to catch the bird off guard with an Electro Ball. Winning this matchup. Skyla sends out her final Pokemon, Swano, with Pikachu offering him any further, pulling him out of the battle and giving Skyla another point for a technical defeat. Tranquil comes back out to face Swana, getting beat up quite a bit until we get another evolution mid battle, where she evolves into the female Unpheasant, having a distinct look separate from the male one. This new energy, along with her new aerial lace move, allows her to be able to defeat the Swana, giving Ash the overall win in the battle and the sixth badge, the Jet Badge. Along their way to their next location, Ash and friends join in on another random contest, this being the Wishing Bell Festival contest that has multiple parts to it, starting off with a quiz leading into a scavenger hunt. From there, it's a race across a lake and even a dress-up contest consisting of doing impersonations, with Ash doing Alder, with Pikachu being Bufalon. After this, there is another race, this time through a forest, and finally, a climb to the top of a staircase to bring their candles that resemble Litwick to the top, trying not to let it get burnt out and cross the finish line up there. Ash ends up losing his flame right before the finish line thanks to Stefan's Litwick candle being an actual Litwick and caused Ash's flame to go out with Stefan taking the win. He also informs Ash and friends that the next battle club they get to, there's a tournament called the Club Splosion as they all now plan on entering. Now arriving in Ambiga Town, the group head to the battle club to enter in in the tournament as it would be some good training
training before he is ready to face off against his next gym battle. We see familiar faces enter in as well, like Bianca, Georgia, Burgundy, and of course Trip, making it a friend and foe filled fiesta of feuds. When it gets to Ash, his battle is with Angus, another trainer with a green monkey Pokemon who has matching colored hair, and even went as far as to style it like the Pokemons. This time being the evolved form of Pan Sage, a semi sage, Ash decides to use his Scraggy for the battle, who is able to have a solid battle with semi sage, resulting in Scraggy comboing Leer to lower the defense of semi sage and then use a strong headbutt to defeat him. With Ash now moving on to the next round of battles, Ash spends some time before his next battle helping Scraggy perfect his newest move, Focus Blast, but things may not just be there yet. Ash's next opponent is Betty, who also has an evolved element monkey, here being Pampor's evolution, Semipore. Some similarities in the hair here, but a little let down that it wasn't exactly matching the way it could be, but oh well. While his Focus Blast wasn't perfect yet, they stuck to the trusty Leer and Headbutt combo. And while Semipore is able to fight this better, one final Headbutt is able to knock back the Water Monkey as Scraggy serves up a final high jump kick to knock it out, sending Ash to the semifinals. I wonder what his next matchup will be. <laughs> the results may shock you, because no, it's not Semiseer, the evolved version of Panseer, it's Throw, as Ash faces off against Montgomery. This battle isn't super long, with Scraggy not being able to get Focus Blast fully nailed down, allowing Throw to get in a powerful seismic toss, knocking out Scraggy as well as Ash from the tournament. Stefan, along with his Pokemon that is opposite to Throw, being Sock, face off against Montgomery for the finals, as Stefan wins. I guess winning tournaments is his specialty. He also wins a year's worth of vitamins, so that's cool, I guess. I don't see any Flintstones vitamins in there, so did you even really win? Continuing on their way, Ash's Swadloon ends up evolving into a Livani, and he's really excited about this. Also, the group takes a rest at another battle club that they pass, but there they meet Seamus, the trainer that abandoned Tepig before Ash came along, and gave him a second chance at trusting trainers, but still has this love for his original trainer, trying to show that he still cares for this guy, but after the group gives him a piece of their mind over abandoning Tepig, he refuses to apologize for doing so and tosses him back to Ash. After a random courtroom drama about the initial incident, Ash and Seamus agree to a double battle, and that if Seamus loses, he must apologize to Tepig. Tepig is pretty conflicted about this battle and his thoughts as a whole about his previous trainer, but still agrees to battle along with Snivy next to him for it. Seamus has both a Heatmore and an Embor for his two Pokemon, with Embor being the fully evolved form of Tepig. While the sizes and power levels are completely swayed to one side, and in general it looks like Seamus replaced his old Tepig to now have his powerful evolved form on his team, the two base evolution Pokemon put up a strong fight against them. Tepig though struggles with his emotions to fully be in the battle, leaving Snivy to hold up a lot of the front end work here thus far, and when both of Seamus' fire Pokemon combine their power of a flare blitz attack sent directly towards Tepig, Snivy launches in to push Tepig out of the way Way, saving him while taking the hit directly and getting knocked out. Tepig now fully starts pulling himself together for the battle, and thanks to everyone cheering him on and showing their love for him, he ends up evolving on the spot into his next evolution, Pig Knight. While Seamus remarks that he still stands no chance of winning this battle, the encouragement from Ash, Snivy, and the rest of the group outweigh those comments, fueling Pig Knight up for a massive new attack, and in one fell swoop, both of Seamus's Pokemon are defeated, resulting in his loss in the battle. Ash, Snivy, and Pignite all embrace in a loving hug, showing how close they all are, as Seamus now apologizes to Pignite, even offering a chance for him to come back to his team, which has him excited for a moment, uh, but then this leads to Pignite using Flamethrower on him to everyone's delight. Okay, well, maybe not Seamus's, but you get the point. We now make our way to Icarus City, where we meet Bryson, along with his Pokemon Beartick, as Ash is interested in training in his ways before finding out in the end that Bryson is the gym leader, and they prepare to battle. Ash sends out his Crocorock first, with Bryson sending out Vanillish. But with Crocorock getting turned into ice from the ice cream, he swaps out Pokemon for now, sending out Scraggy, who is able to take care of the cone. Bryson now sends out Cryagonal. But this isn't your average snowflake. He has no Twitter, or X, or whatever it is now, and here is able to defeat Scraggy. But Ash reassures him that they will keep getting stronger, and for this battle, he did good, and that they will still win. 
Ash sends out Pig Knight next, who is able to finish what Scraggy started. Being able to take out Cryagonal, as Bryson now sends out his third Pokemon, his trusty Bear Tick. And Pig Knight is still ready for battle. But Bear Tick's strength and moveset overpowers Pig Knight and quickly knocks him out, leaving Ash with Krokorok to help pull off a victory. As the battle intensifies and Krokorok is not having the easiest of times here, Ash comes up with a strategy to first use Stone Edge, putting Bear Tick on the defense from the attack, but Ash tells Krokorok to jump up and grab pieces of the stone from that last move, fastening them tightly in his hands like daggers as Bear Tick launches at him with the two clashing midair and landing opposite of each other on the battlefield, as Bear Tick falls to the ground moments later, leaving Ash the winner as he gets his seventh badge, the Freeze Badge. On their way to Ash's final gym battle, they arrive in Verbank City, where they all get caught up in this massive random side plot that involves Verbank's Hollywood-esque traits like movies, the Walk of Fame, amusement parks, and so much more, as they help Luke here work on his film. Ash sees and also saves the mythical Pokemon Meloetta before it disappears for now. Also, this really cool mecha Tyranitar starts going on a rampage. Just kidding, it's for the movies. Hollywood magic, am I right? If only they paid the writers and actors their fair worth, whew, the industry would be better. This movie, however, involves a giant kaiju battle, UFOs, aliens, and even Azora. But by the end of this whole thing, that Meloetta from earlier starts to follow Ash, being interested in learning more about him. Seriously, how many Pokemon are going to just randomly follow this dude? But now Ash heads for his eighth and final battle to which the gym leader is Roxy, a member of the punk band Coughing and the Toxics. Equal parts gym and concert venue, Ash is excited for his last gym battle, with Roxy offering a deal too good to be true, a six on three battle in Ash's favor. But she is the one pushing for this, so Ash agrees to it, and the battle is about to begin. Meloetta is watching from a distance though, sneaking in without paying. Roxy first sends out her coughing with Ash sending out his Bulldor. From the band pumping music to the crowd cheering, this battle is surely going to be an epic one. Now, coughing isn't this unassuming threat that it may seem. Being used to seeing the coughing evolution line through James of Team Rocket's lineup of Pokemon, as this coughing is able to move at a higher speed, easily clearing Boulder for the first round knockout in her favor. Ash may be understanding why she insisted on him having access to more Pokemon for this battle. Unpheasant comes out next, having her speed to help keep up with the coughing, but once again, coughing speed and use of poison moves gets the better of Unpheasant, and becomes unable to battle, already leaving Ash at four Pokemon left and Roxy with her full three. Ash needs a win here, so he counts on his Livani to come out and face Coughing. With a quick combo of lowering Coughing's defense before trapping it in a string shot, Livani tosses the gas bubble around before going in with a strong final hit that finally knocks the Coughing out, bringing Roxy to her second Pokemon, a Scolipede. Scolipede is a pretty powerful Pokemon, getting in some toxic shots onto Livani to a point where it can barely move, being open to a final sludge bomb that takes him out, leaving Ash with half of his team knocked out. He now sends in his Pig Knight, and thanks to the strong fire attacks, Pig Knight is able to show just how strong he truly is by taking out the Scullipede, but not before Pig Knight is poisoned from it. Down to her final Pokemon, Roxy sends out her Garbodor. Roxy also gives Pig Knight a berry that will cure it of its poison, making the challenge more fun for her. But even with the help of the berry, Garbodor was a lot more powerful, being able to counter the fire attack attacks and take out Pig Knight from the battle. Ash now sends in Palpitoad who meets a similar fate from Garbodor, not being able to handle this trash pile's power, and is knocked out. All that Ash is left now with is his trusty Pikachu to hopefully defeat her remaining Pokemon. Garbodor though is still dominating the battlefield, and while Pikachu is still holding his own, Garbodor is able to break through a lot of Pikachu's attacks and defenses, leaving Ash a bit worried here. But thanks to his friends cheering him on, he finds the confidence for this battle and is still believing in himself and and in Pikachu to win this battle. The two Pokemon continue to clash as Pikachu is at one point able to paralyze Garbodor, leaving it open for Pikachu to land a final blow and take it out, with the crowd now paralyzed themselves in shock. Pikachu is still hurt from the poison though, but Roxy hands him a berry to cure him of the ailment and awards Ash his eighth and final badge of the region, the Toxic Badge. Ash is now able to enter the Unova League Championships, and Meloetta, who was still watching everything, is happy about this before 
disappearing for now. But now we enter into the Meloetta arc of the Black and White series for a moment as we have a gap in time before the championships start anyway. The group runs into Cynthia, the Sinnoh region champion, who is here for the Pokemon World Tournament Junior Cup, with the winner getting to battle with Alder, which Ash kind of, but not really, already had, but he is eager to potentially have a real battle with him this time, so of course Ash, along with his companions, all want to enter in as they travel with Cynthia now towards it. As far as Meloetta here, it is attacked by Team Rocket, who wants to capture it, but just ends up getting injured and narrowly escaping, landing in front of Cynthia's car as she slams on the brakes. Ash remembers the mysterious Pokemon from their first private encounter, as they are told from Cynthia that this is Meloetta, as they heal the mythical Pokemon. And as Ash also helps in aiding the Pokemon, it finally wakes up and is excited that Ash is the one they're helping. Oshawott comes out to help as well and instantly falls in love with Meloetta. How adorable. Later on, after Meloetta is feeling better, sings a song and then pieces out for now, Cynthia mentions to Ash that someone at their place she's staying at in Undella Town is waiting to see him as we cut to Dawn and her Piplup in this new region. I love when previous companions make appearances, it just makes the world of Pokemon feel so lived in. I mean, just any people from other regions is really cool. You could say the same here for Cynthia just being in this region. The group all arrive in Undella Town and right now, Meloetta is still curiously following Ash. But here, Ash meets up with Dawn now. Being excited to see her and Piplup giving her a high five as they now chat it up and catch up, as then they all realize the presence of a Pokemon around them with Ash knowing that it's Meloetta and that they're just acting shy. Piplup gets a crush on the singing Starlight Pokemon as well, causing Oshawott to be jealous and starting a rivalry with Piplup. The group spend time together with Dawn as well as Meloetta as they have some time for a little bit of side questing together, going to an island full of onyxes and even a shiny one that acts as a leader to the others in the area. It's always just fun to see a shiny. But eventually it is time for the World Tournament Junior Cup where we see Trip once again, who this time is eager to battle Alder, knowing that he will have to be sharp and at least awake for his battle with the winner this time. All the usuals are here as well once more to battle their respective rivals, hopefully, with each of them being determined to win. Our group is excited to see a fun matchup of Cynthia and one of the Unova Elite Four members, Caitlyn, take place as an opening 10 minute exhibition match that ultimately ends in a draw, but at least it was fun to watch. The first round is quickly blown past, only showing us a little bit of the action, but for Ash, he beats his opponent Maris and is heading to the next round. Ash goes up against Geraldo, who sends out a Reuniclus, with Ash using his Bulldor and is shown to quickly defeat him, sending him on once again to the next round. Iris and Dawn have to face each other here as well, with Iris ending up the victor thanks to her recently caught Dragonite. But now, in the semifinals, the matchups are Cylon versus Trip and Ash versus Iris, giving us an open shot at any one of these trainers taking the overall win here for the tournament. Trip is able to defeat Cylon and advances to the finals with his determination to face Alder, as we now get to Ash versus Iris. Iris sends out Dragonite with Ash sending out his Crocorock, with the battle raging back and forth with two friends giving out their best strategies to hopefully win, not holding back to offer the best possible battle for one another. Dragonite ends up getting the upper hand in the fight as Crocorock is struggling to get up at one point, taking a moment to harness his own will to win the battle and prove himself, beginning to glow and evolve into his final evolution, Crocodile. This new power and energy is shifted for the Pokemon to stay in the fight here, as the two continue to clash with each other. Dragonite, though, has been giving Iris some issues in listening to her as they haven't fully bonded yet, leading to Crocodile getting in a strong finishing hit that knocks out Dragonite, giving Ash the win, and sending him on to the finals to battle Trip once more. Both Iris and Dragonite are sad at the loss as she questions herself and why they aren't on the same page as Cynthia offers Iris some wise words about them training together and truly building that bond, giving her the confidence in knowing that her and Dragonite will be on the same wavelength at some point. Ash is eager to battle Trip though, excitedly running out to the battlefield when it's time for his battle. Trip sends out his superior, the final evolution of Snivy, with Ash sending out Pignite. But will this clear type advantage be enough to keep up with how fast and how strong Superior is? Well, let's see. The battle is fierce and Pignite does give it his all, but in the end, Superior ends up superior. Sorry, I had to. Sometimes the lowest hanging fruit is the sweetest.
or, or something. Ash loses the battle and is extremely disappointed in losing to Trip once more, but his friends are all there to cheer him up and get him pumped up for his next battle with Trip that he knows he will win. Trip is given the trophy from Alder for winning the tournament as they both now prepare for their battle against each other. Trip loses though, which is fine. Alder gives some kind words to Trip as he also promises him another battle in the future once Trip asks for one, leaving him in high spirits and not so mean to Ash before he departs, seemingly looking forward to seeing each other in the championships. Out of nowhere, a new trainer arrives named Cameron as he thinks the whole tournament that just happened hasn't happened yet. They break the news to him that it's all over, and he is upset about this and just pals around with the group for now. Don, however, is ready to head back home, saying her goodbyes to everyone and even Piplup and Oshawott get over their whole rivalry and hug it out. Once she leaves, they all hang out with Cameron for a bit as they watch him go and get his eighth badge before separating from the group. Throughout our time so far in this generation, of the show, Team Rocket along with their leader Giovanni have been working on this whole plan in the background more so than just interfering with Ash called Operation Tempest. For now though, Ash and company are interrupted by a man named Ridley who points fingers at them saying they attacked and stole Meloetta. But before things escalate to a crazy degree, Meloetta steps in and makes it clear that these people are friends and they weren't taken by them. Ridley apologizes for his hostility towards them and explains that he is the descendant of the Protectors, a lineage of people who have been protected Meloetta for thousands of years. He further explains where Meloetta comes from and the ancient abyssal ruins that are lost to time now, saying that Team Rocket has been after Meloetta in order to summon the abyssal ruins once more, but suddenly Team Rocket appears and surrounds the group. Ridley battles with the Pokemon attacking them, allowing Ash to take Meloetta and make an escape, but are quickly stopped by Jesse, James, and Meow. Before things get too out of hand here though, a certain presence is recognized by Pikachu as a Persian appears, this being none other than Giovanni's, who makes his dramatic, cool, bad guy entrance as well. Giovanni notices Meloetta and captures Ash and Pikachu in a cube that starts getting smaller and smaller, offering Meloetta the choice of coming with him or letting Ash and Pikachu be crushed to, like, death. Meloetta ends up instantly agreeing and goes with Giovanni along with Ash and Pikachu who are still trapped in the no longer shrinking cube. Now in a submarine to where the remains of the abyssal runes lie, Meloetta is then put into an altar as a recording of Meloetta's song starts playing, a device that changes the forces of nature Pokemon to change their form that now raises from the runes while this pyramid makes itself visible. Giovanni gets his hands on the reveal glass shooting a beam into the sky that brings forth a raging storm, along with it the three forces of nature we met before. Meanwhile, Ash has Pikachu help him break the cube to be set free as they both now sneak their way to try and rescue Meloetta, but Jesse and James try stopping them as Ridley and Cynthia come and rescue them from the attacks. Giovanni though now has control of the forces of nature, changing them into their Therian forms, to now battle Ash and everyone who all step in to stop all of this from happening, fighting the elements and the forces now controlling it all. Pikachu's electro ball from the electricity surging through him ends up blasting a part of the temple to pieces, setting free Meloetta and the reveal glass flying with Giovanni getting it and staring directly into it on accident, stunning him in pain as it blasts him in the face. In this moment, Ash's Oon Pheasant safely brings Meloetta Meloetta back to Ash, as Giovanni gets up with his eyes glowing red and a glowing symbol now smack dab in the center of his forehead, saying they no longer need Meloetta anyway. Jeez, Pokemon is getting darker and darker with its visuals. I kinda love it. Reminds me of Merrick Ishtar in Yu-Gi-Oh, but I'll talk about that in my Yu-Gi-Oh videos. Giovanni is completely consumed in a path of destruction, controlling the forces of nature to now destroy this whole region. We learn that Meloetta is the balance of these forces, and now that there is no balance, these three forces can be used to cause nothing but destruction. Ridley is able to grab the reveal glass and set it back up in its rightful place, having Meloetta aid in fixing all of this. Ridley requests the reveal glass to grant him the power to stop this as a new beam comes from it and combines with Meloetta, bringing out a melody that calms the forces of nature into a relaxed state, making their way to the reveal glass and entering into their incarnate forms again, and no more destruction is brought forth to the world. During all this, Team Rocket had already escaped in a jet as Giovanni is back to normal now, thinking back on his own desires and wants, nearly causing his own demise. Maybe this means a new chapter for him. Probably not, but who knows? For 
now, the runes sink back into the water as the forces of nature disperse in peace. Meloetta departs from the group with Ridley as they say their goodbyes, with Oshawott left the most upset about this. But that's not the only thing departing, as we are as well from this season of the black and white anime, and what a way to end the season. Such a fun segue into some incredible lore for this region, Giovanni getting a full chance to shine rather than just being in the shadows or sparsely used, and now we have the Unova League Championships left to look forward to. Who's that Pokemon? It's Snorlax! Alright, I won't give you the whole movie spiel again in the next video, sure, but here you should know how it works by now. Here we have another story that features what would have been a cover legendary Pokemon if they made a great version of the video game, Kyurem, along with the mythical Pokemon, Keldeo, as well as the legendary trio known as the Swords of Justice. As we have the film, Kyurem vs. the Sword of Justice. Ash and friends seemingly just get involved by just existing when spotting an injured Pokemon while they're riding a train when suddenly they are attacked by Kyurem, who is heading on a rampage for now, wanting to finish an agreed-upon battle with Keldeo. Ash and friends are able to escape from the train and find themselves tending to the injured Pokemon to which they discover is Keldeo. The reason Keldeo is in this weakened state they're in is thanks to Kyurem. Earlier, Keldeo truly wants to be a part of the Swords of Justice, which consists of the three legendary Pokemon, Terrakian, Gabalion, and Verizion, who have the duty of protecting Pokemon and humans alike all over the Pokemon world. Through Keldeo's training and over-eagerness, Keldeo wants to take on Kyurem, to which the swords discuss this and feel Keldeo isn't ready for that just yet. So Keldeo then makes way to where Kyurem is and challenges the beast, but Keldeo was no match, and as a result of the other swords swooping in once Keldeo's horn gets broken off, we get to see the power of Kyurem, who can draw an energy from Reshiram and Zekrom to transform into what seems like a fusion of either legendary dragon and itself, using this power to freeze the swords of justice in a Ice, as a scared and weakened Keldeo flees the area, leaving the initiated battle unfinished and Kyurem angry, and it explains why it breaks out into the open world where we catch up with Ash and the whole train thing. Iris is able to fill in the gaps about Kyurem with her knowledge of the legends from the Village of Dragons as they go to get help for Keldeo. We also hear about how the swords came to find Keldeo and help raise it as one of their own to hopefully have Keldeo one day join them as an official Sword of Justice. So now this sets us on a path of our hero spending time with Keldeo as Keldeo needs to find the courage within to continue their face-off with Kyurem, defeat the beast, and save the Swords of Justice. This is a very small story, our heroes are barely at the focus here, as this is a personal story to Keldeo, making it feel like an extended in length episode where the group just does stuff, I guess, but Keldeo surprisingly becomes a strong lead to follow for this film, seeing what this Pokemon has to grow through, what losing their horn means, and becoming the strong protector that the Swords of Justice were training Keldeo to be. Ash and his friends just join in for the ride and help in ways like distraction and encouragement, as this is Keldeo's fight and their responsibility to handle to be considered ready for the heavy responsibilities it means to be a Sword of Justice. I mean, there is some bad guy fodder to deal with thanks to some Cryagonal, so there is that for our heroes to deal with here and there, but the swords themselves operate as a trio that can summon light swords from their heads, which is pretty cool, while Keldeo has to learn that his horn, the one that broke off, isn't where the strength resides to be considered their sword. It's something deep within. True friendship. Yeah, a little on the nose, pun intended and I'm not sorry about it, but Keldeo has to understand what makes being a sort of justice special is in fact that it's not for you, it's for them. It's for those who you protect and for those you work with to do the protecting a completely selfless line of thinking to be able to truly summon that strength from inside. Once Keldeo faces off against Kyurem one-on-one -on -one once more, then Keldeo is able to fully summon that inner strength and take to heart what the others have been teaching them the whole time being able to have a completely unique sword all their own as Keldeo's new form, known as its resolute form, comes out, giving Keldeo, as well as the audience, a movie that opens up and closes to both metaphorical and physical transformation, going through a four 
must change to one that has to be understood and reflected upon. Then, and only then, is Keldeo ready to give Kyurem a more confident and calculated fight. But another part of the lessons that Keldeo finally understands to be like the swords is not one of simply winning the battle, but doing what is necessary to be a protector, losing the battle against Kyurem to save everyone else from being hurt. As Keldeo now yields to save the others, Kyurem shows respect and backs off calmly to move on for now, as the battle that he was initially challenged with has come to a conclusion. Regardless of what was learned from the journey, as that literally becomes the whole point here, Keldeo just gets their horn back, which would have been interesting to see Keldeo having to continue on when not in resolute form, having this battle scar that reflects the growth and learning it went through. But it's a Pokemon movie, so a happy ending for all, as Keldeo goes on to continue with the swords while Ash moves on to the next season of the show. Like I said, it really feels like a random extended episode, but for what the story is, it's enjoyable. There's some good and wholesome lessons and values, and I can never look at Keldeo without noticing those giant, bushy eyebrows. Looking like the Eugene Levy of Pokemon out here, my goodness. As we now continue on for the adventure, Ash and friends decide to take time to visit where Iris is from, the Village of Dragons, before the championships start up, giving us some time with Iris as we see her personal story start taking place a bit more. Eventually, we make our way to where the Unova League is held, where we get to see a bunch of familiar faces that we met throughout the region. Once the opening ceremonies happen, we learn about the first round matchups, resulting in Ash having to face Trip right away in the tournament, not having us build up separate battles through several rounds before a major climactic battle between the two happen. Sure, I can appreciate jumping into this right from the jump, but there is something a bit disappointing in not building this up into something larger. For their battle, Trip starts off with his superior, with Ash choosing Pikachu first. Technically, this isn't even the main part of the tournament yet either, being this early on and only being a single Pokemon use battle. As Pikachu and Superior go back and forth, Ash is mentally pushing himself to not lose this time to Trip, feeling that his journey in the region will have been for nothing if he can't get past his current rival here. At one point, with Pikachu already worn out, the two Pokemon collide as Superior counters Pikachu's 1-2 combo of Iron Tail and Electro Ball, causing a massive explosion on the battlefield, allowing the smoke to dissipate from the scene to reveal the outcome, which seems to happen all the time in the Pokemon anime. I'm not complaining, it's a staple of how these battles usually go. And Pikachu is shown to barely be up, but we then see excitement take over as Superior is shown to be knocked out. This surprises Trip as Ash has now defeated him and it was done in an official tournament, with Ash being able to move on in the championships. The two have a moment to speak as Trip knows that Ash has a lot of training to still do in order to face off against someone like Alder at some point as they shake hands and look forward to a future battle between each other one day from the more experience they have left the game, with Trip heading out for now. As the tournament continues on, Ash goes through the different rounds and continues to win, leaving him now up against Stefan, who uses his Lipard, with Ash sending out Crocodile. These two Pokemon show off a nice display of their power, giving us Crocodile at his best, coming a long way from the Sand Dial that he used to be. With not much energy left, Crocodile ends up the victor of this first battle, as Stefan now sends out Zebstrika. Ash swaps out Pokemon for his Palpitoad now, as the two Pokemon seem very evenly matched, coming to a head when both Pokemon knock each other out at the same time, leaving Ash with two wins and Stefan with one. But he's down to his final Pokemon for this battle now, sending out Sock, as Ash chooses Levani next. As powerful as Levani is, Sock's powerful attacks are able to break through Levani's defenses, resulting in him being defeated, as Ash only has his Crocodile left, who is already pretty battle-worn from earlier. Both trainers are at their all-or-nothing moment, having their Pokemon give it their final best shots, with Crocodile ending up the victor of the battle, sending Ash to the quarterfinals. As the crowd erupts in excitement, the two trainers congratulate each other on a great battle, as Ash prepares to face off against the camera kid that they met earlier after the other tournament. As the next day starts, Ash is ready to battle, with Cameron sending out his Hydreigon first, which Ash wasn't prepared for. In response, Ash sends out his Boulder, who learns rather fast how strong of a Pokemon Hydreigon is, getting hit with a barrage of attacks, ending the first round with a Dragon Pulse that completely takes out Boldor. His next choice for the battle is Oshawott, which may not have been the best choice no matter how much heart this little guy gives in a battle with Razor Shell not being able to truly 
really do all that much here, with Dragon Rush being used to finish off Oshawott from that battle. Ash is getting pretty worried about the outcome of this battle now. While he knows Cameron was already not a bad battler, he severely underestimated what he had in his arsenal for this battle. He next sends out Pig Knight, who finally is able to break through the power Hydreigon has, scoring a knockout win for Ash. Cameron sends out his Ferrothorn next, which may not have been the best choice for him as it was at a big disadvantage typing wise and not everyone believes or can fully conquer winning at those kinds of odds, leading to a quick defeat at the hand, or rather flames, of Pig Knight. Now the battle is tied up with the crowd loving the spectacle. To gain the lead again though, Cameron sends out the final evolution for Oshawott, a samurai, who easily takes control of the battle, taking out Pig Knight and Ash now sending in Pikachu to counter. With Samurai using moves like Razor Shell, Ash feels more comfortable in navigating it thanks to training Oshawa, having Pikachu deflect the attacks and use an Iron Tail to take out Samurai. Cameron chooses Swana next, but with both having high stats in their speed, Pikachu is just faster, allowing Pikachu to get in a direct hit with an Electro Ball, knocking the Swana out and putting Ash in the lead for the battle overall. Since Ash is using his closest partner Pokemon, Cameron sends out his, being the Ryalu traveling with him that we saw in his first appearance. And Ryalu isn't an easy opponent. Cameron, however, doesn't have any other Pokemon left after Ryalu for a full six on six battle, continuing his traits of always being slightly off, like being late to that other tournament or thinking that he only needed seven badges so we had to go with him and see him get his eighth badge and now thinking that a full battle was five on five not six on six. Never change Cameron, never change. Nevertheless, he commits to using Ryalu as his last Pokemon for the rest of the battle with Ash still having three that are able to battle. But maybe not for long as Ash swaps out Pikachu for his Unpheasant who quickly gets knocked out by Ryalu. With Ash's team narrowed down to just Pikachu and one other choice, he sends out Snivy to help in the battle. Snivy ends up putting up a strong fight against Ryalu, leaving him fairly weak, but in the heat of the battle and all the cheering on from Cameron, Ryalu starts evolving, becoming Lucario. And one thing we all know about Lucario is that they are for sure no joke in battle. Maybe Cameron does really stand a solid chance here after all. Getting their bearings and being used to this new power, Lucario is able to stop Snivy's constant attacks, landing a direct hit with Aura Sphere, knocking out the Grass Starter. The battle now comes down to each trainer's final Pokemon as Pikachu comes back out to face Lucario. The two Pokemon go at it, coming to a massive collision of attacks leaving both Pokemon weakened, but with Pikachu clearly struggling to stay in the battle. For a moment, Cameron and Ash pause the battle to speak with each other as the two show a great respect for one another and how this battle has turned out, having both of their Pokemon continue on to decide the fate of their time in the championships. Pikachu gives it everything he's got left, but Lucario just couldn't be stopped, evading an Electro Ball from Pikachu and landing another solid Aura Sphere attack, knocking out Pikachu resulting in Ash losing the Unova League as the two trainers thoroughly enjoyed an intense battle that pushed them to do the best that they could. Virgil, another trainer that they meet briefly before the tournament started, ends up being the overall victor for the Unova League in the end though. Afterwards, our main group along with all of the trainers, friends, and rivals alike hang out and share their compliments to one another for some great battles and great entertainment before they all separate. Ash spends some time with Stefan as they discuss what their immediate future holds for them as Ash isn't going home just yet, planning on spending some more time in the region, but both trainers plan on becoming even stronger for another battle at some point. Ash also goes to spend some private time back at the stadium reflecting on how the battles went understanding what went right and what could be improved on in his training. He notes that his journey isn't over for him. He is still determined to be a master and another league loss isn't going to stop him. Our main trio come back together to continue on for what else the Unova region holds. Now, if you know anything about the black and white video games, there is a certain storyline and a certain character who hasn't made an appearance in the anime yet. So as we move forward, meet up with Professor Juniper again and see that Team Rocket is back to their usual business of trying to get Pikachu. A new green haired character comes into play, all the while Ash and his friends are heading out to the White Ruins in hopes of seeing the other main legendary Pokemon for the region, Reshiram. Ash also looks forward to this extra credit gym battle, wanting to get some training in to prepare for it, but Pikachu senses this new character watching them as he approaches. He's kind and calls Pikachu cute and said that he heard a friend's voice, claiming that he considers all Pokemon to be his friend and that he can hear their inner voice and instantly can tell how close of a friendship Ash and Pikachu have. While being a bit weirded out by this guy, he introduces himself with the name N. Just the letter 
N. When Ash tells him that they are in search of hopefully meeting Reshiram, a flashback occurs for N, as we see this legendary Pokemon wanting to burn down the world through N's encounter with him some time ago. But he doesn't mention this to them. He learns that Ash has already met Zekrom, and wants to know more about that as Ash goes over what happened at the start of his journey in the Unova region. They both discuss the legend of the hero who is able to turn the darkness into light, having a pure connection to Pokemon, and being able to work together with Zekrom as N discussed that there is the same story, but a version of it with Reshiram. The group and N continue to discuss their goals and ambitions, with Ash of course claiming to want to be a Pokemon master, and N wanting to discover all of the mysteries in the Pokemon world. When Team Rocket interrupts the moment, N is at first shocked to see and hear Meowth who is able to speak like a human, but also demonstrates that he is able to seemingly speak with Pokemon in a way that no one else can. Summoning the help of some Alomomola he sensed were around to help out Pikachu after their encounter with Team Rocket. While N departs from the group for now, he looks forward to seeing them again as he thinks there must be a reason that Ash had an encounter with Zekrom in a similar way to how he had one with Reshiram. For now, Ash gets to meet Charon, a new gym leader whose gym isn't officially open yet as the two have an unofficial battle mainly for fun and for training, giving the students of his watching a chance to get excited about becoming Pokemon trainers. Charon sends out his Herdier as Ash sends out his Oshawott, showing off a fun back and forth battle but Herdier is able to get the better of Oshawott here, resulting in Ash losing. At least it was fun for both of them and it made Sharon more confident in being in the position that he's in. We also get into some more of the black and white video game lore as we meet with Looker, a character who comes around here and there and honestly you can make a whole separate video on just this character and all the theories surrounding him alone, but for now he is there in the pursuit of Team Plasma, another shady organization out to do some dastardly things in the Unova region. So of course Ash and company get tangled into a storyline of helping out and stopping them. At one point Team Plasma gets control over Pikachu, showing off the power of the technology that they have. But do you know what's stronger than a machine? Friendship. So Ash begs and cries out to Pikachu who then is able to short circuit the device and set himself free once more. Team Plasma and their lead scientists are able to make an escape from the area before anything else really happens. And until the next encounter with this new regional bad guy team, Ash and his friends continue on to the white ruins like before. We already catch back up with N who makes a daring rescue of a braviary captured by Team Plasma and ends up a bit hurt from this, landing in need of some help in front of Ash as they all head together to help the bird Pokemon. N talks about his own personal mission in freeing all of the Pokemon that Team Plasma is trying to place their control on as everyone agrees to aid in N's crusade. This leads to another altercation with some Team Plasma grunts coming back after Braviary, with N not backing down to them with Braviary feeling a connection to N, and would rather help in this situation, with Ash and Pikachu also jumping in to help. Once they defeat the Team Plasma grunts, they end up releasing the Braviary back into the wild, as they now help N get his injuries treated and have him travel with them for the time being. Not long after this, the group stumble upon a Kanto-themed fair, one that celebrates the culture and Pokemon from that region, and shares it in the Unova region. So Ash feels a sense of nostalgia when seeing so many things that remind him of his home region, and he is excited for his friends to experience this as well. After helping a Charmander at the fair, Ash reminisces and goes over his own early days of traveling with his own Charmander, and what their time together entailed all the way up until he became a Charizard, and why he isn't a current member of his team. All of this leads to Ash wanting to see and spend time with his Charizard again, having Professor Oak help get Charizard back from Liza, sending Oak his own pheasant who will love flying around with Ash's other bird Pokemon from regions past. Ash gets his Charizard now in return and sends him out as they're all excited to see him and his friends are in all of this powerful fire beast. Charizard though is interested in Iris's Dragonite, wanting to square off, so Ash challenges Iris to a battle, which she accepts, and the two titans start going after one another, leaving Dragonite a little bit too hurt for N's liking, so he calls the match. He claims that the two now have had the chance to show off their power to one another and have settled whatever display of power they wanted to prove. Charizard also stays with Ash for now as the adventure continues, which is nice to see. Always glad that Charizard gets to shine for Ash here and there, and it did feel like a long time since we've seen him anyway. Coming across more Team Plasma shenanigans, our group here gets in the way to help stop a Haxorus that is being controlled through more devices made by Team Plasma. Through intervening here, N ends up getting hurt as Team Plasma notes that they have found N, and confirmed it's him before leaving. As two girls end up coming to grab N and head out, with Ash and friends following them into the forest. They place him in some water that begins healing him back up, as these two are his foster siblings 
sisters, and N tells them that they are good people and can stay here for the time being. N opens up more in regards of why he is on a mission to rescue all of the captured or controlled Pokemon at the hands of Team Plasma, going into his backstory about why he doesn't like Pokemon battles. All being tied into being sold the lie by Team Plasma saying their dream was to free all the Pokemon with N's ability to hear the inner voices of them, persuading him to be a part of Team Plasma before he found out the truth, leading to the Reshiram attack and these two girls helping him and since then, N has been an ex-member of Team Plasma wanting to do right by Pokemon and stop them from hurting any more Pokemon. Ash and his friends go back and forth a bit with N and his sisters regarding the relationships between Pokemon and humans, saying that not all humans are cruel or mean to Pokemon, with the two groups not seeing eye to eye on every viewpoint in the regards of there needing to be a separation between humans and Pokemon, for the creatures to be able to truly live free. I do like when Pokemon gets pretty introspective like this, getting to see where the ideals behind the ethics of being a Pokemon trainer and battling with Pokemon come from. Obviously, Pokemon in the lore of everything have this natural want to compete against other Pokemon, wanting to grow strong and have these bonds with humans? For the most part, sure, there are outlier situations, but in general, the relationship Pokemon and humans share is mutual and one built on respect, which can come in many different forms of how these bonds are built. Ash has clearly been proven to grow and understand what it means to do right by his Pokemon. Has he stumbled here and there? Yeah, he's 10, but he's constantly becoming more knowledgeable and compassionate towards all Pokemon, whether they are his Pokemon, someone else's Pokemon, or just wild Pokemon. It's cool that the games and now the show continue to explore people within the world of the IP having these internal conflicts on both sides of the discussion like Ash and his friends or N and his sisters, giving the viewer a moment to reflect and build an understanding. Some Team Plasma grunts have found the location of the secret hideout using a dimensional portal to try and capture N as the sisters then blame our group for this and they all fight back against Team Plasma. In this altercation, Ash tells N to get out of here with his sisters to safety as and reluctantly does so by the end, disappearing from view along with the forest thanks to the use of Gothitelle's psychic powers. As the fog dissipates, the group sees a large tower through the clearing. This is the Dragon Spiral Tower, and upon looking at it, Professor Juniper's assistant comes and gets them to bring them to the White Ruins. When meeting with the professor as they find the light stone, she picks it up and it becomes consumed by fire, shooting a beam of fire up into the sky, getting the attention of N as well as all of Team Plasma, leading them all to that one central point. N jumps in as the professor is explaining the mythology behind Reshiram and how the Pokemon declares someone special as a hero with a pure heart, as Professor Juniper wants to study the stone further, but in saying that, N grabs the stone thinking that all it is to her is something for humans to benefit in the form of knowledge from, and runs off with Ash in pursuit. It is until Ash falls into a pit trap, barely hanging on from slipping all the way in, but N turns back to help him. With the ground becoming unstable, he starts falling in as well, now having to sacrifice possession of the stone to save Ash, as it drops and falls into the pit, but hey, both of them do as well, ending up falling all the way to the bottom, as Ash and Pikachu seem to be okay with N checking in on them to make sure, as now their pathway to get back out of it is blocked. The two now spend their time discussing their views along with how extreme his sister's views are, as N sits in this middle ground knowing that there are people like Ash who treat Pokemon with respect and see them as family, not just trying to use them for personal gain or being plain cruel to these incredible creatures. This also gives Ash a moment to explain that the professor's scientific studies on something like the Lightstone provide pathways to better understand Pokemon, something in the benefit of helping build the relationship Pokemon and humans share. It's easy to see it in a negative light thanks to how bad-intentioned people like Team Plasma would use a stone like this, but there is a difference for whose hands it's in, scientific or not. Outside of this conversation, Team Plasma has started attacking the ruins as Looker jumps in to help Ash's friends and the Professor get to safety. Team Plasma starts using their controlling device to have Pokemon go and attack them as Iris and Silent try and fight back, but things aren't looking good. With N sensing trouble through hearing different Pokemon's cries, the two know that they need to get out of the situation that they're in fast and help out. Ash sends out his whole team of Pokemon who all start helping get them out as N sees and begins to fully understand how Ash operates as a Pokemon trainer and how much his Pokemon care about him and are willing to help him as much as he would do anything for them. Crooked Isle is able to make a path for them to get out as now they can make their way back to the surface. But with the power of Team Plasma's device, Ash's Pikachu fights back against what it's doing to them as one of Team Plasma's higher ups, Colrus, is directly targeting them now. With Iris telling Ash to return his Pokemon quickly and Looker trying to buy them time. Ash gets all 
all of his Pokemon back in their Pokeballs safely, minus Pikachu, who once again falls under control and starts attacking them. Ash won't give up on Pikachu, ever, as he gets in front of Pikachu begging him to stop this, with Pikachu hitting him directly with his attacks as he just takes it, using whatever strength he can muster up to still confront Pikachu, trying whatever he can say to use the power of their bond to break through the control of the device. As Ash makes his way closer to Pikachu and is able to lay a hand on him, Pikachu attacks him once more, leaving Ash passed out with N watching in horror of everything going on. He tried to make an offer to give Team Plasma the Light Stone if they just free Pikachu, and if they don't accept, he will destroy it. They agree to this and Pikachu is free once more, passing out from what the control did to him. Team Plasma takes N and the device and head out to bring forth Reshiram to control him. As Ash and Pikachu wake up a bit later and are happy to just see each other, the leader of Team Plasma, Getsis, begins the ritual as N's sisters appear to rescue N from captivity. N tells them what is going on as the sisters want to get him out of there and leave in safety, but he wants to prevent from what he has witnessed before happen again, and to that on a bigger scale. N stands firm on not going with them and avoiding the situation. He wants to help Reshiram and find out how he can help the legendary Pokemon. The control device ends up going after the psychic Pokemon that were helping the sisters and stops them from doing anything further with Reshiram emerging onto the land. N begins to try and speak with Reshiram, but it's useless at this moment as the rage flowing through Reshiram is too great, especially now with Getsis taking full control and commanding the Pokemon at his will. Team Rocket has been in the shadows mainly, but want to steal the control device for themselves. But Looker stops them and pleads for their help in destroying it instead, to which they think this will be the moment that they can do something to get one over on Team Plasma and look pretty good to their boss doing so. Colrus tries to stop Ash from getting involved further by using the device on Pikachu again, but Ash stands in front of Pikachu this time to protect him as Meowth launched in to help get Ash to safety, telling them that Team Rocket is now helping Looker and now the whole the enemy of my enemy is my friend thing comes into play, well at least for now, as Ash tries to have Pikachu just stay at a sight while he goes and deals with things, but Pikachu comes running in to help him as they make their way to the device. Iris, along with Team Rocket, help keep the other controlled Pokemon at bay as Getsis commands Reshiram to go after them, stopping them from reaching the machine. Pikachu makes an attempt to send in an Electro Ball, but Colrus hits him with another direct shot of the device as Pikachu tries everything to resist it, trying to ward off Reshiram with an attack as N can finally hear Reshiram's inner voice. Somehow, the electricity from the attack is helping break through to Reshiram for to use those bolts as a way to escape the control. Pikachu is blasted with the device even further, but he is still pushing through it as much as possible, as Pikachu sends another attack in with Reshiram trying to send in an attack as well, leading to the destruction of the machines, bringing the Pokemon under its control back to normal. Reshiram is now building up its own power, stronger than ever toward Team Plasma, taking out their jet so there is no easy escape for them. N steps in though to speak with Reshiram before it continues to do more to them, regardless if they deserve it or not, and N explains to the legendary beast that there is a world in which Pokemon and humans can coexist, a world that doesn't contradict the values that Reshiram holds based on his legend, and how the beast sees things. Suddenly, all the rage stops. Reshiram has begun to calm down while all the rage seems to be at Getsis now, berating Reshiram. All of the good guys here are able to now capture Team Plasma to bring them to justice, as N asks Reshiram how it feels to see humans and Pokemon come together to stop evil doings. After a brief pause, N smiles, as he understands the Pokemon's inner voice before it parts ways and they all say goodbye. Iris wanted to know what Reshiram said to N, but Ash said that they will get that answer in the future when they meet Reshiram another time, as they are all at peace once more. With Team Plasma under arrest and discussing a new invention, one that lets them understand Pokemon, our group says goodbye to N and company, with N trying to work with his sisters to now fully understand his goals of helping make the Pokemon world one of which humans and Pokemon fully understand one another. As far as this part of the storyline, this is where we cut off before the final arc of the Black and White Saga ends. It's a weird situation where it's really one season that is split into two story arcs, with this part giving us all of the end storyline featuring Team Plasma and Reshiram, with the next part adding and beyond to the title of the show to wrap things up. This part was very exciting though, giving us discussions of Pokemon ideals, some really fun characters, and even some Team Rocket helping save the day. All we have left to do now is finish our Unova adventure in the final part. Part. Who's that Pokemon? It's Abra! Abra.
Our final movie to discuss in this video for today is Genesect and The Legend Awaken, which would be a nice little look into the next generation of Pokemon for both the games and the anime when it comes to changing a Pokemon's form temporarily. In fact, we get the change right away, seeing Mewtwo, no, not the one and only Mewtwo from the original film and sequel special, but another Mewtwo that is out there in the world now, meaning that there are two Mewtwo's, to which this one shows off that it can use some energy to heighten its power levels by changing its form from just Mewtwo to Mewtwo Y. Why? Well, don't jump to the next generation just yet, we'll get there, okay? Mewtwo ends up finding and rescuing a bunch of brand new Pokemon known as Genesect, as some of them are purple, but one of them is red, which technically means it's a shiny Pokemon, and based on what I'm about to say after this, does it technically count as a shiny Pokemon? Because these are kind of like man-made Pokemon, essentially? Mewtwo gets into the mind of one of the Genesects to see that originally, they were this 300 million year old Pokemon discovered in modern day as fossils that Team Plasma brought back to life and turned into these metal insects that managed to escape their captors. We see that the Genesect are searching for their home, but the red Genesect thinks that Mewtwo is a threat to them and tries to fight, but Mewtwo explains that their home is no longer there after all these years of being extinct. Mad overhearing this, the Genesect fly away together. They notice a city that they feel reminds them of home and head to it, as this is where Ash and friends intersect into the Genesect storyline. And the city they're in is New Torque City. It's a very creative name there. There, our group makes their way to the nature park where Ash runs into a very timid Genesect. After startling it as they end up calming down, and then the red Genesect shows up thinking that Ash was a threat, with Mewtwo also showing up to save them from the attack before all the Genesect leave again. Mewtwo gets to speak with Ash and friends in regards to what the Genesect are and how they all came to be, as Mewtwo feels for them, having a similar origin story of how Mewtwo was brought into this world. The Genesect find a place to feel at home for the most part, taking over an area of the park, scaring all of the local Pokemon away from the area, showing off their power by taking on a Fraligator and being the victor. This Mewtwo has a moment to reflect back on its origins, but they seem to be fairly familiar, but like, I swear, this is a different Mewtwo. Like, maybe like a, just a different attempt in the same vein as how the original Mewtwo was created. Essentially, the movie turns into this battle for territory as Mewtwo ends up having to face off against the main red Genesect, with Mewtwo using the Mega Y form for their battle, while Ash spends time with the Genesect that doesn't want violence, and and do what they can, but this really turns more into a film following the Red Genesect and Mewtwo more so than whatever Ash and friends are doing. Mewtwo would rather get through to the Genesect rather than continue any pointless fighting, grabbing the Red Genesect and flying straight up into space, trying to push itself further with its power limits as they freeze up and Mewtwo blacks out when pushing that far above Earth. When Mewtwo wakes back up as they both float above the Earth, the Red Genesect stares back at the Earth and all of its beauty. Mewtwo finally has a chance to calmly speak about that that this is their home. They both come from here and they are here for a reason. They are alive now for a reason. Red Genesect finally starts listening to what Mewtwo is actually saying. They aren't searching for a home, they have a home. And that people can be friends, despite the bad eggs out there. People and Pokemon are friends, not enemies. Upon taking Mewtwo's hand and heading home, Mewtwo has pushed too far and is gassed out, falling unconscious as they fall back to Earth. The Red Genesect grabs Mewtwo's hand and uses the last of its powers to reach out to the other Genesect, as they all then fly in to help along with Ash's Charizard and Iris's Dragonite, as they now start crafting together a net to catch them. But it doesn't work as Iris has some Pokemon help create a padding of water for them to land in, as they end up safe because of it, with Mewtwo helping the Red Genesect out of the water, with them now approaching the others as the Red Genesect starts saying that everyone is a friend. Which, sure, let's go with that, it's a lot easier to deal with that rather than fully teaching them about not everyone being a friend, but for now, yeah, everything is all good, everyone's a friend. We get to find a new area where the Genesect can truly call their home and live happily in peace, starting their new resurrected life with Mewtwo being thankful for Ash's help and happy that they met as they hope to meet Mewtwo again one day as they take off in their Mega Y evolution form. So now Ash has helped multiple Mewtwo's, and we may get some more evidence of more than one Mewtwo in the future. Maybe I'm just playing coy. Maybe that's the end of the movie. Well, it is. That is the end of the movie. There are some cool ideas in this film, like having a Pokemon 
created to be born having to face off against and help show the way of understanding the current world to a different resurrected ancient Pokemon that was also infused and manipulated by scientists for the purpose of being used by man as a weapon. While the overall conclusion or understanding for the Genesect may not be as deeply thought-provoking or offering up the viewer something beyond surface level to take away, the story did one thing for me, and that was to feel multiple emotions through the Genesect. Whether it was the Genesect that spends the movie just wanting to go home to a time that no longer exists and is friendly but mainly timid, or from the shiny Genesect that learns that people and Pokemon are friends to them. Not everyone is some evil organization scientist wanting to use them for personal gain. We also get to see what a Mega Evolution is, getting the chance to see it through this new Mewtwo who can take the form of its Mega Y variant. All of the fun Mega Evolution talk though will be in my next video where it is the main mechanic of that generation. And after seeing all this generation's movies, I must say that the biggest thing standing out to me is that the first movie has two version perspectives and changes of what happens. I don't think any from this set of films here offer too much to you that you haven't seen in some other Pokemon films, and to that point, done either a bit better or having a more thought out point to what the message is trying to say. They offer some fun moments, some cool Pokemon, but lack in fleshing out what the story could be, aside from maybe the first movie we talked about, leaving the last two pretty much as extended episodes. More so the Keldeo film than this one, but it's how I felt after it. None of it means a lot to the main part of Ash's journey anyway, aside from emphasizing the character of Ash that we already know and get more from within the show. So let's go ahead and get back into that to wrap things up for what's left in the black and white anime. We start off this epilogue arc with Ash and friends at Professor Juniper's place, getting a moment to calm down from all that has just happened with Jesse and James speaking with Giovanni about taking down Team Plasma, getting a congratulations from him which means a lot to them, regardless of how impressed or not the boss truly is. But for them, it's back to business as usual trying to get Pikachu once more. Ash was ready to now head back home to the Kanto region, as Iris and Silen both want to come with him to better their personal journeys as well. Ash calls Professor Oak to let him know that they're on their way taking a boat back to the region, and we get a nice little cameo from Muck once more, smothering Oak in excitement of seeing Ash. After an altercation with Team Rocket and nearly leaving on the wrong ship, the crew meet Porter, who will navigate them back to the Kanto region through the Decalor Islands, that are in between their travels from one region to the other. As we navigate through the area, we get to stop at some fun places, bringing up a lot of similar feelings to the Orange Islands, as our group gets to have some fun side adventures in the area. One of their stops is on Scalchop Island, where there is another little side tournament called the Scalchop King competition for Oshawats and Duots to take place in. Ash's Oshawott wants to enter naturally, with the winner getting a solid gold Scalchop. Team Rocket is entering in as well, but in disguise and having Meowth cosplaying as a Duot to trick their way in. The competition is broken down into several rounds, starting off with a Scalchop exhibition, showing off their individual Scalchops as the judges take into consideration how nice they look from their shape that they're in to the specific color they are. The next round involves their accuracy of throwing their Scalchops chops at a target, with the round after that involving the strength of them as they use their scout chops to break through as many bricks as they can. Next, it's a stage performance with them, to which Meowth gets outed out as not being a duot, leading to the final round, as the last two participants having to battle is Ash with his Oshawott, who has made it that far, facing off against a duot, where Oshawott needs to build up its courage of facing the stronger evolution of himself that shocked him scared all the way back towards the start of the series. Luckily, Oshawott is able to land the victory here, winning the whole competition competition, and after being given the award, a caveat about the competition is brought up saying that Oshawott will now have to be the ruler of the island, meaning that he has to stay on the island as king until the next competition comes around next year, with Ash now left in shock. He sees that Oshawott is excited to spend time here with the Queen Oshawott and considers letting him stay here to be happy, if that's what he truly wants, but we quickly see that she may not be in love with him, so in his heartbreak, his Scalchap falls and breaks, which suddenly disqualified him from being the King Oshawott and now the runner-up becomes the winner, and Ash gives Oshawott confidence again that despite not being the king Oshawott of the island, that the two of them have each other and will continue their journey. On another island, our group meets up with Professor Oak, giving us a fun little reunion as we see the professor go after and catch a Rotom, before saying see you soon and continuing on through the islands for now. Now, we've had random episodes throughout this generation of Pokemon that deal with a lot of the uh, UFO Pokemon. The uh, Are they even Pokemon at this point? Because we also have an interesting encounter 
here with the alien Pokemon, aka some Bahiam, that involve a crashed UFO and these Pokemon controlling everyone around to help them look for a missing piece of their ship that will help them get out of here. And at one point, they end up using Meowth as this mouth puppet to communicate, and that's pretty fun. And in the end, Ash helps them in favor of freeing everyone by giving them an amulet coin to fix their ship and head home, thanking Ash for his help. But we need a little tease for the next upcoming region, and for that matter, generation of Pokemon. During the Grand Harvest Festival on another island, the group meet up with a reporter from the Kalos region named Alexa, who travels around the world as we get to see some Pokemon that are brand new that Ash's Pokedex can't help him learn about yet, like Helioptile and Gogo. Ash also enters in a sumo tournament with Pig Knight and ends up winning, earning a focus ban as they spend time with Alexa, hearing about the Kalos region as she joins the group for now on the ship. We see another familiar face on Cave Island, with that being Claire, one of the gym leaders from the Johto region, who we got to see catch a shiny Dredagon here. We also learn that Alexa has a Noivern, another new upcoming Pokemon in the next generation, and one that holds a special place in my heart. I just love this Pokemon so much. We eventually arrive in the Kanto region, and Alexa is excited to meet Professor Oak to interview him for journalistic purposes. Now sharing some food in Vermilion City, Iris and Silen speak with Ash about where they are interested in going, having spent a lot of time with Ash and gaining so much experience in training, learning, and growing. They both want to start off on their own journeys as Iris wants to head to the Johto region to learn more from Claire and her dragon-type ways. Silen wants to participate in a fishing tournament, and it would take him through the same region as Iris, as Ash is both sad to see his friends go, but is excited for them to live out their personal journeys without him. They share a heartfelt goodbye with one another as Alexa stays with Ash on their way back to Pallet Town. There were also two special episodes that were unaired in the States that each follow the journeys of Iris and Silen, with Silen crossing paths with Brock, which is pretty cool, and Iris training with Claire, catching herself a gibble, and having her own legendary encounter to guide her excitement of her adventures, seeing a Rayquaza fly by and wanting to see where it's heading. For Ash, though, we reach the final episode in the Black and White series, as Ash and Alexa arrive in Pallet Town, spending time back at his house as Alexa gets to spend some time with Professor Oak. We get to see that Tracy is still happily working with the Professor at his lab, and that's great, and Ash gets to show all of his past Pokemon his new Pokemon, spending some time hanging out with all of them. Team Rocket tries to spoil the fun at one point, but Ash has his Pokemon all go in and make quick work of getting them out of here. You know, I'm blasting off again. We get another moment of Team Rocket now meeting with Giovanni again, happy that he is at least somewhat proud of their work taking down Team Plasma. But Giovanni takes all of their Unova Pokemon, but at least Wobbuffet's back, so that's a win. Back at Ash's house for dinner, Ash says that he wants to head out to the Kalos region and take on the Kalos League there, needing to face off against a new set of eight gyms for badges to which Alexa's sister is a gym leader over there and makes note to go and see her first. Ash's mom leaves the room as Ash worries that she is mad or sad about her son leaving again so soon on another worldwide adventure. And while that may be true, she returns with a new outfit for Ash to wear, already fully knowing that Ash is going to be heading back out into the world and wishes him success in this new region. During the night, Ash thanks Pikachu for always being by his side and going on all of these adventures with him. The two are both determined to give it their all there in the Kalos region. And the next day, they arrive at the airport with Ash dripped out in his newest look, saying goodbye to his mom and Oak as he and Alexa board the flight. One thing I love is that they never forget to add in some emotional moments between mother and son. The heart and invisible felt support to keep Ash going as Ash's mom, with tears in her eyes, watches the plane take off, confidently knowing that Ash knows she's always on his side, rooting for him every step of the way, no matter how far from home he is or how long he's away, as we now have officially ended the black and white era of the anime. And wow, what a great way to wrap it all up. Structurally, it was interesting in how they approached splitting the arcs, not having anything involving N or Team Plasma until after the Unova League, giving that story its complete focus rather than here and there building it up, even giving us our own little island arc again, which turned out to be really fun, getting us prepared for where Ash's friends are going to go, and to that matter, where Ash is going to go. Ash here seemed to be at his best throughout the seasons, being a lot more focused on how he trains and works with his Pokemon, being able to take on gyms a lot better despite having a rival that could easily make him feel like he's not progressing as a trainer to reach his Pokemon Master goals. Overall, a surprisingly solid entry into Ash's journey, and it leaves me extremely excited to dive back into the XY era in the Kalos region, where things may get a lot more serious story-wise, and heck, maybe even more than Ash is expecting for his own personal relationships with both humans and Pokemon. But that will be for next time. For now, let's take a look at Ash's relationships with both people and Pokemon this go-around. Who's that Pokemon? It's Psyduck! Psyduck! 
Ash sure caught a lot of Pokemon this generation. Mainly all early on, but still it was good to see him capture a lot of new Pokemon to befriend and train. First off, his relationship with Pikachu is as strong as it ever could be, showing off from the beginning that no matter what, even if it causes him pain, he will be there to help Pikachu. Whether it's from the power of Zekrom or from the power of a mind control device, Pikachu works hard to get stronger throughout, and coming in clutch for some battles and mastering some new powerful combinations, like having Electro Ball being a huge difference for how some battles go, and still using Iron Tail for even more tactics on the battlefield. Ending off the series on a strong bonding moment between Pikachu and Ash as they plan to take their training to another level for their time in the Kalos region, to get as strong as possible and continue their unbreakable friendship. In the case of Pitov, it was a no-brainer that Ash was going to be just fine when it comes to training her. He's been shown to work well and master his bond to his feathery flying friends, but this go around, we do get a lot less time here as opposed to the likes of Star Raptor or Swellow. Like, there's no bird contest this time, but that's okay. Pitov, then Tranquil, then Unpheasant had plenty of moments to shine in battle or just help out in several situations outside of that, making Unpheasant a fun, pokey companion for Ash for a while. Oshawott definitely had the most screen time here, aside from Pikachu, popping out of the Pokeball at the perfect comedic beats, whether it was for something fun or whether it was him trying to prove himself in battle. From his intro and being so powerful and confident to then quickly learning that there is still plenty of training left to go when it comes to keeping that confidence in battle. Oshawa was able to prove to himself that he is capable of believing in himself thanks to Ash and friends, although there may be no saving him from his hopeless romantic ways. Pignite became a powerhouse Pokemon in his own right, coming in clutch several times for Ash in battle, starting from rather sad beginnings being ditched by his original trainer. And sure, the sad fire Pokemon left by their owner has happened, well, a lot, but starting as a Tepig, we get to see how he grows past his old feelings towards his original trainer, going against him in a battle when they cross paths, seeing that he would only want him back after he evolves into a Pig Knight during their battle. He's also a good Pokemon sumo wrestler. Snivy from the jump was pretty powerful and kept that strength throughout her time in the show, helping out Ash in many ways, but also showing her caring side when it came to comforting and then protecting Tepig from his own owner. While staying small and in her first evolution form, Snivy never gave up regardless of the size or strength of her opponent, putting her faith in Ash to be someone she could see herself traveling around and growing alongside. Scraggy is an interesting one, as he was hatched from an egg that Ash was given and had a lot of problems when it came to mastering some powerful moves in battle, but Ash never gave up on him, confident that their training will always be important to him as he believes in Scraggy. And while still not having 100% confidence in himself, he still can pack a punch or kick or even a headbutt if needed. Nivani was also a powerful choice in battle, having that dog in him since he was just a Swaddle, going from this base evolution to a Swad Loon to eventually a Livani, that I think maybe should have had a bit more screen time in the show to show off more of his power, but hey, that's just me. Palpatode, however, was always fun to see in battle, having the strength to endure so much without taking much of a scratch in some cases, if any. So there was moments where Palpatode really got to shine, and I think that they were a great addition to the team, with even more power left to unlock. Another Pokemon with plenty of power left to learn is Bulldor, starting off as the funny little fellow Rog and Rolla. Bulldor definitely offered some solid battles, but was used sparingly, helping to advance Ash and stuff like that Junior Cup. Of course, there is Crocodile, with some snazzy sunglasses, starting off as a little sand dial just following Ash around, to eventually evolving into a Karakarok to battle against him, and training to become an even stronger Pokemon, ready and willing to train alongside Ash at any moment, having this unrelenting respect for the trainer that bested him. Eventually, he evolves into his final form, Crocodile, and delivers some incredibly powerful moves during these intense battles. Also, yeah, Charizard comes back around for a little bit, always good to see him, nothing too notable to point out aside from how well he works with Ash now, comparatively to all the way back when. But one thing is for certain, and that is that Ash has built up a strong bond between himself and his Pokemon. There is a reason why so many of these random little Pokemon just follow him, whether he gets to capture them or not. <coughs> Meloetta. <coughs> and why some Pokemon easily give him respect, and why he's able to navigate through the Pokemon world in the ways that he has. You love to see it. But let's take a moment to talk about his other companions and rivals that he met throughout Unova. 
Iris is his newest companion when he gets to the region, giving him someone who at first is pretty much an isolated trainer until she comes around to fully traveling with Ash. Sure, she was friendly from the jump, but in order to learn from Ash and train as they go, she gains a lot from growing a nice friendship with Ash. Maybe not the closest to Ash like some of the others, but someone who is still there no matter what, finding themselves along the way for their own goals to be a dragon master, and finding that push to go off and make her own story happen. Silence definitely an interesting one as he starts off as this gym leader who is at first judgmental about Ash's battle style, but comes around to understanding what makes him tick as a trainer, how he's able to beat a lot of the odds and showcase tactics that, in theory, don't make sense on paper, having to realize that it's the trainer and his connection to his Pokemon that is making the true difference there, as he becomes extremely interested in following Ash's journey after being defeated by him, understanding more about his own skills at being a Pokemon connoisseur. I also want to bring up Trip as a rival, and it would be easy to just label a lot of his personality and actions as a Paul clone, but even with that being said, he had his own interesting way of training Pokemon and viewing the world as he just started his adventure. Thanks to Ash and Alder, he is able to change how he views other trainers slightly, not being as harsh on Ash in the end, and not having this giant climactic ending battle with Ash, just losing to him in the first round of the Unova League before setting off to pave his own new path. Overall, I like the new companions that Ash travels with here, but I do feel that there is some more backseating for them. Iris does get to go into more of her past and forge out her own plans, but in comparison to the other companions of the past, they didn't have as much of an impact on Ash specifically as some others may have. Again, I still enjoyed them a lot and enjoyed where their stories ended up, but rival-wise, yeah, I could have used someone a little more exciting to constantly have a battle with back and forth, whether it be with Pokemon or verbally for Ash, especially after pretty much getting what we got here last generation, but it was never to a degree that I felt annoyed at it or bored with it. There was one person that did offer the most interesting moments for me this generation, and that was N, a character that has a deeper connection to Pokemon that is stuck in this internal conflict of how he views humans and their Pokemon relationships, giving the viewers as well as Ash the most introspection, as Ash has multiple moments of just having a conversation with him or him and his sisters about their views and why they all see things differently, and by the end, a new way to view the connections between humans and Pokemon. One that doesn't contradict the love that N has for Pokemon, and what the ideal world for all to live in would be. I do think it was done in such an engaging way that doesn't paint any side as the bad guy aside from those who seek evil through the use of Pokemon for their benefit, whether it hurts Pokemon and humans or not. But now that we have conquered such a fun and different region for the world of Pokemon, next time on our journey, we enter into the world of Pokemon XY, where the story beats become a lot more serious and fleshed out for Ash and his traveling companions, but so much more than what it seems on the surface. So I will see you next time as we head to the Kalos region. Make sure to leave a comment down below to let me know some of your favorite memories and moments from the black and white era, from the video games to the anime, what part of it stood out the most to you for your personal enjoyment. But thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in part six soon. Like and subscribe for more. Later.